Welcome to stream. My name is Dr. Rachel Tatman and my stream slash channel slash podcast, I guess if you're listening to it as a podcast, is for anyone who cares about language, technology, and other people. Um, and I've added a comma in there between language and technology because we talk about both those things and not always just the, you know, you know, intersection union. Hi Alexa, hey Jerome, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so I'm going to keep doing what we did last week where I've sort of divided things into topics and then we've got a couple miscellaneous categories. So we're going to start talking about some stuff around meta and their, their ad targeting. Uh, and then uh, we've got a couple stuff, a couple things, I guess, about facial recognition. Uh, and then uh, Lenza, which some of you may already be familiar with. Uh, and also a couple of pieces from different uh, artists on, on AI art and how it's affecting them. Uh, and also, I guess, sort of in the general subject of artists, um, there's been a lot of discussion uh, online about uh, Archive of Our Own, uh, which is a fan fiction hosting website. Uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Hello, Henry. Welcome to the stream. Uh, and yes, we're going to talk about ChatGBT. Uh, I don't think we can't not, you know. Uh, also, Twitter news and updates, just FYIs. Hi, MP. Uh, and then general, uh, oh, I don't actually usually <laughs> put the stuff in there, but generally professional stuff, um, things that are relevant to folks working in language technology, um, or I guess technology generally, not just language technology. Uh, and again, some politics, um, mostly court cases. There's one uh, city council ruling for San Francisco that's, again, relevant to folks working in, um, you know, machine learning generally. Uh, and then we're going to end off with just some fun. Some some lighthearted stuff towards the end. Uh, and if you would like all the links, as always, those go out to my coffee supporters. Um, it is ko-fi.com slash R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. I can spell my own handle. Good job. Um, and those have not actually gone out today. I would say they're about 70% done, um, but I've got a lot of links today. So the annotation is just taking a little bit. Uh, yeah, Henry says, uh, I really like Facebook's OPT 175B. Not sure why it's not talked about as much as GPT-3. Looks like it's super useful. I mean, we'll talk about the utility of these sort of systems in a little bit, but uh, I mean, as for why it's not talked about as much, um, publicity, marketing, PR, etc. All right, let's hop right in. Uh, so Meta. Uh, so first up, we've got a, um, so this is actually from May of last year, but I'm bringing it up because it's gonna be relevant to the next thing that we talk about. So this is from uh, the Signal blog. Signal is an encrypted messaging app. Um, that's very you know consumer privacy focused. Um, also, Meredith Whitaker, who's uh, someone that I you know worked with when I was doing AI ethics stuff, uh, is now I believe the president, the CEO of Meta. Med De? No, Signal. The CEO of Signal, the mm, president of Signal, possibly, but she's in a leadership position. Uh, and because they are very, you know, data privacy and consumer rights focused, uh, they, you know, do do some research as an organization. Um, also, just as an aside, if you use Signal for your SMS texting, I believe that feature is going away relatively soon. So uh, maybe look into alternatives. Uh, Alexi says, I really like the 101 uh, video. Only suggestion would be to at least generally outline the whole thing, even though there is no strict script. It helps students know where they are. Uh, there is an outline. Yeah, it was like slide four, I think. Uh, and it should have chapters. I haven't actually double checked that the chapter is rendered correctly after I uploaded it. Um, but yeah, there, there, was a, there was an outline uh, in, in the video, I promise. 
Uh, and they did a research piece, uh, basically serving ads to folks, letting them know specifically how they had gotten that ad, what targeting information uh, was used. Uh, Alexa, you also want to ask for some of the linguistics insight for the NLP video. Yes, there will be more linguistics to come, I promise. Uh, so an example here, um, the an ad that they would serve to somebody would be using information that, you know, Meta had uh, access to or had inferred. So this is specifically on Instagram. Uh, you got this ad because you're a newlywed Pilates instructor and you're a cartoon crazy. This ad used a location to see you're in La Jolla. I think that's in California. Uh, you're into parenting blogs and thinking about LGBTQ adoption. Right. Um, so these ads were actually banned by Facebook slash Instagram. But the point of the, the signal team was to show the amount of information that was being harvested about by you from you about you by Meta. Um, and the reason that this is relevant is that uh, there is currently a court case. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things going on legally right now, but this court case I thought was particularly relevant. Uh, so this is from the Washington Post. Uh, it's a piece by Naomi Nix. It was published December 1st and also updated on December 1st. Uh, Rami asked if I've ever met any LGBTQ people. Yes. <laughs> um, Drum says, just ask chat GPT about linguistics. I wouldn't recommend that as a learning strategy. So, uh, Alexi says, oh, I mean an outline of the whole NLP map and where the thing you're talking about fits in there. Uh. That is much higher level content than is in the Text 101 video. So th those of you who aren't familiar, I've started a new series on my channel, my YouTube channel called Text Data 101. Uh, and the first video, so the, the learning goals of this series are to help people who are working with text data for the first time um, build their understanding of what's in their data um, in a way that allows them to continue on whatever work it is that they're doing. So it's not specifically geared towards just folks working in NLP. Um, I'm also thinking about, you know, humanists who are doing digital humanities. I'm thinking about, you know, teachers. I'm thinking about data scientists who are maybe more on the analysis side. Um, I'm thinking about students who are just coming to it for the first time. So uh, it's a much broader audience than, than just NLP practitioners um, that I have in mind. And I don't know, hopefully that, that came out. Um, but it does sort of like have the slightly narrower focus of um, people who at some point in the future or currently are working professionally with text data. So that's sort of the general idea of that, uh, that series, which is ongoing. The second video will come out when it's done. <laughs> uh, I got a lot on my plate. Uh, so, um, this piece from the Washington Post. Uh, and this is a um, ongoing court case, um, or I guess complaint. So the EEOC is the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, uh, which is basically what says like, hey, you can't discriminate against people based on their protected characteristics, specifically in the field of uh, employment. So like offering jobs, compensation, etc. And the issue here is that a female truckers group, so um, women who are truck drivers, uh, alleged Facebook's ad system is discriminatory. Real Women in Trucking alleges in an EEOC complaint that Meta is steering ads for lucrative jobs away from women and older workers. So um, both gender and also age are protected characteristics, um, you know, in the, in the United States, in the specific category of equal uh, employment. Uh, so you'll sometimes see in job ads in the US something like, we welcome all candidates regardless of their, you know, quality and various qualities that they have. Um, and that is to uh, avoid being <laughs> uh, sued by the EEOC. Um, so ongoing, um, the complaint has been lodged, not entirely clear what's going to happen from here. Uh, but uh, the, the issue here is that I think it's not necessarily direct discrimination by Facebook, even though they ha have at least in the past been found to um, allow direct discrimination, right? So for example, to only show ads for housing to uh, people who have been inferred to be white by Facebook, um, as an example, which is 
super illegal. Uh, Facebook says you can't do that anymore. And um, the last research study I saw, which was a while ago, I don't know whether or not this is the same case, is... Uh, <laughs> um, but even if this is not like directly discriminatory, if the effect is that not everyone who is eligible for the job is being shown, you know, the ad at the same rate, regardless of their protected characteristics, it may have a disparate impact. So the fact that this targeting is being used, right? So if we're, if we think about some of the categories here that Signal is identifying, for example, people thinking about LGBTQ adoption well, probably, <laughs> probably that's going to be someone who's queer, right? Straight folks don't usually think about doing LGBTQ adoption, right? Um, right, oh, should they, straight, cis, etc., non-queer folks. Uh, and as a result, if you, you know, filter on that tag, even though you're not explicitly saying, hey, don't show this to somebody who uh, may potentially uh, not be cisgender straight, um, that would be the effect. So there would be a disparate impact, even though it wasn't intentional. And basically this, this complaint is alleging that that's what's happened. So TBD, how it'll shake out. Facebook in particular has been called out for this in the past. Um, like I mentioned, the, the housing study that was done a while ago, it was a couple years ago. I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the, the current state there. Um, and then of course, the Digital Services Act having gone into effect in Europe. So this all has been in the US context. Um, there are really strict regulations or restrictions in that about what you can do for targeted advertising. Um, and I believe there's also some court cases currently going on in Europe around targeted advertising in Facebook. I'm not, uh, Facebook meta, more generally, I'm not a um, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I am someone who was impacted by uh, tech law and um, cases around this. So I'll keep an eye on it. So FYI. All right. Uh, Alexi said it would be cool to get some law people who work in ML invited to the channel. Um, Help my friend today with law related things with his lawyer. Uh, not really to ML, completely different world. Yeah, definitely. That's a good point. Yeah, I should reach out to some some legal folks. Uh, Jerome says, in a world where ag algorithms are tag driven by probabilistic uh, models, it is not surprising to see inequality in ad targeting. Here's the thing. In the United States, some characteristics in some situations are protected, right? And what that means is that it is on the burden of proof is on the people developing the algorithms to show that it is not discriminatory, right? So in a lot of, you know, domains, especially in the United States, uh, I'm, I'm less, less clear about other folks, you know, I'm from other places, I'm from the US. You know, if you have, let's say a, a, a um, uh, you know, a housing ad that you're serving, uh, it's on you to show that you are not being discriminatory. Um, and in this case, you know, if complaints are like, hey, you're being discriminatory, you have to prove that you're not being. So a lot of folks will choose not to use probabilistic algorithms for that specific problem, uh, because we know from, you know, decades of research uh, that if you start with a class imbalance and you attempt to learn on that class imbalance uh, in your outputs, the, 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 you know, the degree of um, discrimination will actually be greater than it was in the original training data. Uh, so a great citation for that would be uh, Min Also Like Shopping from 2016 that showed this, particularly in the NLP context. I'm sure there's um, other, other papers in other realms, but I you know, work in NLP, so that's what I mostly know about. Um, and if you can't show that you're not being discriminatory, again, crime, <laughs> uh, a crime. Uh, so for example, a lot of banks, uh, when they do sort of like automated mortgage application stuff, to my knowledge, most of that is not probabilistically done. Most of that is not done with machine learning um, because it would be so difficult to prove that they weren't being discriminatory. So yes, issues. Uh, Alexi says, I see the danger of it, but on the other hand, I would be happier to see LGBTQ plus friendly ads as an LGBTQ plus friendly person. Yeah. And I mean, there's the, there's the challenge, right? Uh, okay. We got, I see some other, um, other discussion now. I'll go back and make sure we talk about it. Um, that's the challenge because to some degree ad targeting is helpful, right? Um, so for example, if you're like, hey, I am I have this training program on how to be the best Pilates instructor you can possibly be, 
you want Pilates instructors to learn about that, right? You don't necessarily want uh, plumbers who don't take Pilates <laughs> uh, to learn about that because they're just not going to be interested in buying it. Um, so on the one hand, I can see the argumentation that, hey, you do want to, um, you know, have a certain degree of ad targeting. Um, and I'm not opposed to ad targeting entirely. What I'm opposed to is uh, what I call uh, social category detectors, right? So in this case, um, inferring that someone uh, is, let's say, queer, um, perhaps, yes, it may serve them more, more useful ads. However, this is a group that has historically and currently been persecuted um, and had a lot of violence, both at the state and individual level, done unto them. So having a way to automatically tag people as like, hey, hey, I think this person is part of this, you know, currently and historically oppressed community, look at them, here they are, um, has clear malicious secondary uses, right? Um, and even something as, as innocuous as, say, like a language ID um, program can have that, that potential uh, malicious secondary use, right? So we talked on the channel a while ago about how a lot of, you know, an independent investigation found that a lot of Uyghur language apps um, were feeding data back into question mark, <laughs> uh, probably, um, you know, probably to people who uh, were actively doing violence against the Uyghur people, right? So the issue is not necessarily that ad targeting is happening if it is not for something that is high stakes, right? Like Pilates training, not high stakes. Whether or not you get a job offer, whether or not you know about a well-paying job, whether or not you know about a house for sale in an area that you're looking to buy a house, whether or not you know about a, a mortgage that you can qualify for, whether or not you're approved for the mortgage, whether or not you get into a school, um, all of these things are very high stakes. Um, areas right uh and the the challenge there is with this you know the the if there is an existing imbalance particularly if it's due to you know historical uh prejudices then the issue is that it is very very hard to mitigate that right so even not just mitigate but also not um increase the the rate of disparity so yeah, and I mean, that's a lot of the, the AI fairness work has been on, but also my, my general recommendation is for things that are high stakes, you shouldn't automate them, right? Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have the option to do like, hey, I don't wanna show these housing ads to you know, people who are only of a specific um, ethnicity or something. So yeah, and I think it's important as, as technologists that we think about the secondary uses of the things that we build, right? Um, I'm trying to remember who, who said it, and I, I can find the citation if anyone really wants it, um, but someone said that the big difference between a data product and another type of product is that you know how people will use another product. A data product, you have no idea how people are going to use it in the future. So we, you know, just as careful technologists, we have to be defensive of our, of our users and potential future harms that may come to them because of our choices. So anyway, that, that's my stance. All right. Uh, Henry says, how effective is the current language technology at parsing two to 300 words? Uh, for example, an immigrant describes a specific situation, asks a question about social assistant, can models represent text well? So you are asking about different things, right? So uh, the first thing that you're asking about is text parsing. Parsing is the specific task of inferring the syntactic structure that underlies a particular piece of language output. Um, that's a specific task. Uh, then the thing that you are describing, I say would be question answering, again, as a specific task. Um, and I mean, pretty good, right? So that's that's more of an information retrieval task. Um, I would say that in general, that you know, works okay, particularly if you have a longer text span like that. Um, particularly if, let's say, there's only three resources to choose from. If there's, you know, 300, then obviously it's a much less tractable problem. Uh, and then uh, representations of text, there are many different ways of doing that. A very popular one is to use um, a multidimensional vector space. That's what a lot of current models use. Uh, but you will also see more um, 
Uh, you'll also see text representations like parsing that are more uh, structured, um, and you uh, ontologies are another good example of a really structured representation where you can talk about the the relationships between various entities. Um, for example, an ontology would tell you something like Paris is the capital of France. Yeah. Uh, Shabam says, joining after a long time. Is there already a video on ChatGPT? Nope, we're going to get to it today. Uh, what's the balance of female male in the trucking business? I don't know about the gender balance specifically. Um, I think it historically has skewed a little bit more male. Uh, yeah. Uh, Seth says, of course, each advertising platform has its own class imbalance, but uh, that is, accounts and usage do not reflect the larger population distribution. Yes, and I would say that's a global problem as well, right? Like, internet access is not evenly distributed. <laughs> um, and uh, not living in a place with government censorship is also not evenly distributed. So, um, yes, definitely. Uh, definitely an equity and an access issue. Uh... Yeah, Alexi says, I would not mind to see ads related to your, my ethnicity, which may not be interesting to anyone else. Still very scary if the detection algorithms will be used maliciously. Yeah, how do you know that those ads are um, not meant to hurt you, right? Um, and perhaps, of course, I am from the US. I am from a social situation where a history of um, extreme racialized violence and oppression is uh, just baked into the fabric of my social situation. and. Um, Perhaps you are from a place where that is not the case, in which case, good. <laughs> right? Like, I prefer that that wasn't the issue, but that's the lens that I take with me into the world, right? Is that um, I know that people have been hurt and killed because of their race, so, and ethnicity. Yeah. Uh, Alexi says, that's what we have to think about. It is, but also, we have to think about it as the technologists, right? If we have, you know, the the power and the responsibility and you know the big ch paychecks that go along with it then we also have you know we need to have accountability to to both the consumers who use our things but also to society as a whole so, yeah hmm jerome says everything can be used in a malicious way and in my opinion accusing tech is the wrong target it's more important to focus on education educate the masses for inclusivity i mean that's definitely part of it right education is important but tech is an enabler right it's a force multiplier so you are not necessarily forcing people to do harmful things but you are enabling people to do harmful things at a much higher scale than they otherwise would have had access to um, and i don't think that we can just sort of um you know absolve ourselves of the responsibility for the role that we play Uh, Robbie says, the future is unpredictable. Taste and preference are constant, continuously training. That's true. That's true. Uh, of consumers. Uh, does the U.S. have a digital currency? I don't know what you mean by that. Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I'm also not an economist. Economist. All right. Visual recognition. Um, speaking of issues. Right. Uh... So, uh, this has been a, um, an issue, apparently. Uh, so this is from MIT Technology Review. Uh, it is by Varsha Bansal, Bansal, B-A-N-S-A-L, Bansal. Uh, it came out December 6th, 2022. Uh, and the headline is Uber's facial recognition is locking Indian drivers out of their accounts. Some people are finding their accounts permanently blocked. Um, and I believe this was also reported on by rest of the world. I don't know why I used this link instead, but um, multiple news outlets have reported on this. Uh, but uh, basically the... Um, interesting i had not seen this correction um so the the top of the there's a bit at the top that says uh correction the story has been updated to include uber's response the opening has been amended to remove an anecdote about a specific driver's experience based on that response interesting yeah and uh Okay, so we still have we still have various anecdotes about uh, drivers who are being locked out of their account. Uh, in this case, uh, Adnan Taki. Taki. Again, apologize. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. Uh, please feel free to correct me if anyone knows the correct pronunciation in the um, in the chat. I know the International Phonetic Alphabet. Please feel free to use it. 
uh, who was locked out for uh, 28 hours, a big dent in his work schedule, reading here. He says he drives 18 hours straight, sometimes as much as 24 hours to be able to make a living. This gives me hives. <laughs> um, the labor exploitation is a... Uh, indefensible <laughs> ah. uh, but anyway so he was locked out of his account um, you know one time in a way that made it very hard for him to make a living um, and another time uh, he was locked out of his account for a week um, he suspects it came down to having shaved his hair or sorry hadn't shaved his hair for a few days and his hair was grown out a little bit um, others say they have struggled with scratches on their camera and low-budget smartphones. The driver problem isn't unique to Uber. Drivers with Ola, which is backed by SoftBank, face similar issues. Um, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. uh, after publication, the company said that no deactivations can take base place based on facial recognition alone. It says that real-time ID check works by escalating flagged non-matches to at least two humans who then check the photos manually. This process takes less than 25 seconds. It says its tool can handle changes in hair. Nevertheless, more than a dozen drivers interviewed for the story detailed instances of having to find better lighting to avoid being locked out of their Uber accounts. Whenever Uber asks for a selfie in the evening or at night, I have to pull over and go under a street light to click a clear picture. Otherwise, there are chances of being rejected, uh, says Santosh Kumar, an Uber driver from Hyderabad. So, um, I've mentioned on the channel before, I'm just going to say it again, biometrics should never be used for authentication. This is my stance as a technology professional, um, and also based on my, my discussions with folks working in the security field. Um, this sucks. <laughs> this sucks so much, and I hate it. Um, I also hate that they're having to work such long hours. That is absolutely, um, again, labor exploitation. So, uh... <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Ravi says in India it's launched. Okay. Uh, I've not really been keeping up with uh, the currency news. Uh, Henry says the chief decision scientist at Google says chatbot is a GAN. Is it possible to have more information on the model powering GPT? I mean, they haven't published a paper. There's a blog post. Um, they say that it's a variation of another model, but you know, they have no, they've released very little information publicly on about their specific model. Um, we'll talk about it later. I'm <laughs> trying not to get sidetracked. Yep. Uh, Shabam says, uh, there's no digital version of the US dollar. Oh, thank you, Shabam. Uh, Seth says, for safety's sake, I also, I don't think Uber should al shouldn't allow driving for more than 12 hours straight. So I believe the regulations in the United States are for... Actually, one sec. I'm going to mute for, for just a second and holler. Uh, I'm going to have to look it up another way. <laughs> oh, did I wake you up? Sorry, buddy. Sorry, I woke my dog up. Uh, oh, you drive a big ring. Yes. Um, yeah, in the U.S. we have uh, federally mandated um, uh, driving times where you need to have a break. And I want to say it is between four and eight hours. Big uh, ring without a break. Um, Mm -mm 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 -mm. Uh, drivers can drive for up to 11 hours during the duty period. However, after driving for eight hours, the driver must take a break of at least 30 minutes. Breaks of any kind count against the 14 hour duty period time. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, am I also against fingerprints? Uh, for, um, bio like for authentication like i am the person who this account belongs to yes absolutely um yep <laughs> very much so any sort of biometrics fingerprints voice prints uh facial recognition retina scans um in general not a fan of them no uh, <laughs> alexi says waking up laser sounds oh did you hear him yeah he uh he does say pew a lot uh 
also in facial recognition, there is a new piece out from Georgetown Law's Center on Privacy and Technology. Um, Georgetown is a university, actually it's pretty close to where I am in Virginia, I believe they're in DC, just north of us. Um, and uh, basically it is a huge report. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. They talk about multiple cases um, and various examples of facial recognition technology being used by police in the United States. Um, and basically they're like, hey, there are an enormous amount of errors here. Um, in their words, as a biometric forensic investigative tool, facial recognition may be particularly prone to errors arising from subjective human judgment, cognitive bias, low quality of manipulated evidence and underperforming technology. These errors have real world consequences. The investigation and arrest of an unknown number of innocent people and the deprivation of due process of many, many more. As the grassroots movement, grassroots movement to ban police use of facial recognition grows, invoking many overarching ethical problems with this kind of surveillance technology, it is important to point out that facial recognition doesn't work well enough to reliably serve the purposes for which law enforcement agencies themselves want to use it. Which. Um, all great points I strongly agree with. Um, and if you're interested in reading the report, they talk about a number of people who were wrongfully arrested, um, who were detained, um, who, you know, uh, had violence done unto them. So not, not great, um, period, right? Uh, uh, I think I've made it pretty clear over the course of my channel, uh, even for those of you who are fairly new, that I am strongly against the use of facial recognition technology, especially in a, um, you know, uh, criminal justice context. So, you know. Uh, Joan says, don't trust your brain facial recognition. The person talking on YouTube is not Rachel. I mean, you have multiple ways of, of uh, identifying who I am, uh, and I trust you to be a human living in the world who can do that. Uh, what do I suggest is a better alternative to biometric authentication? Great question. So, um, you know, secure passwords uh, are definitely one layer of uh, protection there. And another would be two-factor authentication based, um, you know, my preference is for a physical device like a YubiKey. Um, I also, you know, generally don't prefer something like a phone number that can be redirected or spoofed. Um, so you know, a secure password, uh, ideally one that's, you know, been generated, uh, and also um, something like a YubiKey that shows that you are in physical possession of the same thing that you were when you originally made the account. Um, I also don't think email accounts are necessarily a great way to do authentication due to the, you know, the issues with maintaining email accounts and also phone numbers, to be honest, for large uh, portions of the population. So that's my preference. Rachel, that's boring. <laughs> I just want to unlock everything with my my face and my ear print. A boring is good. <laughs> We're a fan of boring. All right. Yeah, uh, Seth says authentication is based, you, typically based on something you know, the password, something you have, you know, a, um, uh, a YubiKey or something similar, uh, or biometrics, which um, again, I don't recommend for a number of reasons. All right, talking about Lenza. <laughs> uh, this Rachel does not exist. Um, I mean, that's, you know, a question for the philosophers, but I would say that you all as, um, you know, independent individuals that know that you are independent individuals uh, perceive me in a meaningful way. So I think that's good enough. Uh, so this is a... Uh, it's this one, not this one. Uh, for those of you who are, are watching, uh, it is not Lenza.com, which is a, a job seekers thing. Uh, it is a site that generates AI selfies. Um, you probably know where this is going to go, uh, but there have been some pretty bad issues with it, uh, particularly when women have tried to use it. So this first piece is from Insider. Uh, it is by uh, Catherine Tangalakis Lippert. That looks Greek. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jerome says, uh, Rachel adds about YubiKey Maker. Yes, I am not, uh, I'm not sponsored by YubiKey. Um, I don't know that I'd be a, a great partner for them regardless based on sort of general content, but I would recommend them just like as a person. 
Uh, MB Timothy says the whole idea of security is to make it harder for you to be hacked, but privacy and data usage is more of a policy thing. Yeah, but here's the thing. If you are using something that you can't change as part of your authentication, like your face, your voice, um, your retina print, your fingerprints, and that information is hacked, it can now be spoofed and you can't change it, right? Like without going to extremes, I can't change my face enough <laughs> to no longer be, you know, visually or automatedly recognizable as the person that I am, right? Changing your fingerprints is, um, challenging to impossible, right? And certainly not within the reach of the vast majority of humans. So if that information becomes compromised and, you know, Again, very spoofable, right? Um, 3D printing is a thing. Um, you're, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do about it. So uh, also from a security standpoint, I think that it is not a great choice. Um, yes, so uh, Insider published December 6th. Um, and the uh, the output, the headline is Lenses AI's owner says the company's face changing tech can be tricked into generating not safe for work images, but some users are saying it happened to them without even trying. Um, and this report compiles a bunch of different reports. I've also heard it from additional sources um, that, you know, nude, um, you know, sexualized images are sort of the default, uh, particularly for women when they upload their face. Um, and I actually don't know off the top of my head what Lens's training data is, but if it is lie on 400, we talked about that on, what was it, Tuesday, right? That something like northwards of 10% of all data, even after the clip filtering in the Lion 400 million data set is porn. Um, which again, like I said, I, I don't think that there's any problem with the existence of pornographic imagery. Um, it, however, has resulted in a very skewed representation of certain populations in the model. Uh, uh, Schwamm says, being able to change your authentication information is a valid point, yeah. Uh, Sess says, again, with two-factor biometric, two biometric recognition wouldn't be sufficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alexi, I remember on the news one drug dealer tried to disfigure his face so his phone would not recognize him and be unlocked by police. Uh, yikes. I mean, also, I would recommend just not having <laughs> any sort of biometrics turned on. Uh, what I was looking up, lens of training data. Uh... Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the data uh, based on stable diffusions, open source generator, uh, and I believe stable diffusion is trained on Lion 400M, uh, assuming they're using uh, one and not two. I don't know about two, two just came out. Um, I haven't looked into it much because I don't care. Uh, it's Lion 400M, right? Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Mm -mm. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, yeah, so the, the training data set, which we, we talked about that paper on Tuesday, is disproportionately full of um, sexualized images, particularly of women. Um, and it sounds that this, like, it sounds like this has really affected women who are using this app in that it is generating um, sexualized images of them without their needing to prompt it. Um, and I gotta say, the the company, and I've seen this, you know, sort of argumentation from them in a couple places that like, oh, well, it's because you're using the thing bad. If it's happening with no prompting, then maybe you built a thing bad. Maybe your safety filters aren't good enough. Maybe you shouldn't be charging people for this product that is not safe to use. <laughs> maybe, possibly. Maybe that's my take. Um, also, if you're not aware, this is a paid service. I want to say it's, oh, I just had it open a different tab. Do, do, do. I want to say it's like $8, um, which is you know, just not insignificant. Yeah, uh, but basically, uh, uh, one user wrote on 20, uh, 
I put 20 pics into Lenza and it came back with a bunch of AI generated nudes. To be clear, none of the photos I submitted included nudity, which the app specifically prohibits and yet generates. Uh, the sentiment was echoed by dozens of others, mostly women, saying the app has automatically generalized sexualized or outright nude photos of them despite avoiding not safe for work reference photos in their upload. Um, well, Lenza parent company, Prisma Lab, CEO and co-founder, Andre Usultz, Usultsev, U-S-E-O-L-T-S-E-V, I am sure that I said that wrong and that some of you uh, know how to say it right in the chat, apologies, told TechCrunch, such images, quote, can't be produced accidentally by the app. He said that it could be provoked to create nude images through, quote, intentional misconduct, such as uploading nudes against the terms of service, uh, which prohibits uploading content that is obscene, pornographic, indecent, lewd, suggestive, or otherwise sexualized. This is a lie. You are lying about the capabilities of your, um, your application. And I know that because I know about the capabilities about the underlying system that it's built around. And I know about that because I know about the data set distribution in the initial data that it was trained on. You would have to go back from scratch to create a system that would reliably not generate nude images. It would have to not include nude images in the training data. And you're not willing to do that and put in the work. So instead you blame the consumers. This shit pisses me off. Mm. Don't lie to people. Don't lie to people. Why? Moving on. Uh, oh, uh, another piece from Wired uh, from De on December 7th from Olivia Snow also generated nudes from her childhood photos. Again, nothing that she uploaded was suggestive. Uh, I should say this was against the terms of service. Lenza specifically says that you shouldn't upload photos of children, probably because it generates nudes of them and they're fully aware of that. Are generated images, you know, CSM? I don't know, but I do know that if your your app that you're charging people for is doing this, maybe you shouldn't have released it in the first place. Maybe it's not a reliable, safe piece of technology, and maybe you shouldn't have been asking people to use it and pay you to use it. Possibly. Just maybe. Uh, Total Expectation says, is there a source that shows the distribution of the Lion data set or whatever data set Lenza was trained on? Uh, yes, so the paper that we talked about on Tuesday uh, was by Abeba Verhain and co-authors, and I'll pop up the link for that real quick because it's relevant to this discussion. Mm. Uh, look at it up here. It, it pisses me off when people do shitty stuff like this, and I can't help it. I can't help how upset I am because I just, it's bad for society and it's fucking bad for the field. People aren't going to trust machine learning as a field. And honestly, based on the way folks are conducting themselves, I don't think they should. I think that that distrust is warranted. Uh, so here I'm logged in. Sorry, I'm going to find the, the paper. Um, do, do, do. I should say it's by uh, Abeba Burkane and co-authors. This is from 2021, uh, and they were looking at the filtered version. Uh, so it had done clip filtering, which proposed to remove the, the majority of these sorts of images, and it didn't. Uh. Yep. Uh. Robbie says, what's the identity card for US citizens? Uh, how does the government recognize the public? Um, great question. Uh, there are a variety of state issued, uh, usually state issued identity cards. So driver's licenses are sort of the big one. Um, you're not required to have one though. Um, oftentimes when you need a form of identification, um, you know, there's a lot of them, right? It's very, it's sort of very chaotic. Um, there is a upcoming requirement to have a specific identification card that meets a certain uh, standard for flying that's been two years away sort of perpetually <laughs> for the past couple decades or so. Not quite that long, but um, we have passports if you want to travel internationally. Those are uh, administered by the federal government, but we don't have a single universal identification um, card so. uh yeah uh, Alexi says, I also want to double down on the you cannot change your biometrics argument. Changing the key is a very piece, basic security feature, which must exist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Drum says, uh, 
a fake AI generated nude pics should not even be taken into account in work related businesses. As a manager, I do not care about nude pics of my team members. Um, I assume what you're saying there is something like this doesn't really have a place in the professional world. I'm not, I don't care if nudes are generated of my team members because um, I would certainly care if my team members were generating nudes of me. Uh, that would feel like a gross invasion of my privacy. And also, as a resident of Virginia, it would be illegal. Um, so I'm, I'm in a, I live in Virginia, which is a state in the United States, and at a state level, um, any sort of non-consensual sexual imagery of possession of non-consensual sexual imagery is illegal, uh, or redistribution of it, and that does include generated imagery. So, sometimes I just wake up in the morning and I'm like, is my field making society worse? And on balance, I don't know that we are. <laughs> But there are certainly people who don't wake up and make it better. Uh, we talked about that. Um, also something that has been a big discussion lately outside of the field, and y'all may or may not be familiar with it, is the use of the, um, you know, labor that people have done to generate things that are intended to replace them, right? Um, so particularly, this has been an issue that visual artists are pretty upset about, right? So visual artists, the output of their labor is visual art, uh, particularly if they're working in the digital medium, it may be a file. Um, a lot of folks, <coughs> including Sable Diffusion, right? Like it's in the uh, Lion 4 m data set, 400 million data set has included a lot of images from um, professional artists of their work. Um, Again, we'll, we'll talk about in just a second about some of the, potentially the licensing issues there. Um, and that the output that is being generated, a lot of folks are claiming they will be using instead of the services of artists. Um, and as a, you know, I am someone who very much enjoys art in many forms. Uh, I want it to continue to exist. Um, and also I live in a capitalist society. So something that is very important to me as an individual who again, enjoys art is that artists are fucking paid. Ooh, I'm starting a lot on this one. I may have to add an explicit tag <laughs> on my, uh, uh, my podcatcher. Uh, which is why my channel art was made by a human being that I paid for it uh, and also credited in my about section. Um, it's important to me that this happens. Uh, and you know who else it's important to is artists. So this is a longer video. I'm just gonna pop the link in the channel. Y'all can check it out if you like. Uh, it is from uh, Steven Zapata Art. He is a uh, uh, artist on YouTube um, who does tutorials and also draws uh, and um, Basically, it's a very long discussion of um, how the use of artists' art to generate images um, in their style is hurting them. Um, also, it's very well, you know, sort of cited. Uh, has a lot of discussion of the the various um, you know companies uh, working in it, and um, yeah. Uh, just, uh, I think, a very helpful viewpoint from someone outside of our community about the ways in which um, it sucks. <laughs> uh, and a great point uh, that, uh, that he made that we've also made on the channel is that um, so the, the dance diffusion model, also from Stable Diffusion, was trained on public domain music and that this training happened after record companies were like, hey, if you train on our IP, we're going to sue you. Um, but that it doesn't seem to matter when it comes down to individual independent artists because, um, you know, it's very much, uh, this is something I've been thinking about. It's very much a colonizer attitude, right? That you have something that's valuable. We're going to take it. We don't care if you get any sort of restitution or remuneration for it. Um, and we're going to use it for our own ends. And there's nothing that you can do because we have the power and you don't and, you know, screw you. Um, and that, is not an attitude I can condone. Um, but it's also, you know, very common in the field, right? Um, and I get it. Sourcing data is hard. It takes work. It takes effort. It is not easy. Um, and if you have more data, yeah, generally your results are better. Uh, but if you have more data that you have to take against the explicit wishes of the people who produce the data in the first place, um, is that worth it for you? Uh, is that not going to 
keep you up at night? I mean, I guess for some folks it won't, but um, certainly for me it will. And it's already had a very negative impact on, on you know, some of the artists that I talk to and follow, right? It's hurting their mental health. I've, I've seen discussions from multiple people who are like, I'm not going to do art anymore because I don't want it to be stolen or I'm going to do art, but I'm not going to share it anymore because I don't want it to be stolen and used for profit uh, in a way that will never benefit me and directly hurts me. And, um, that sucks, right? That's making the world less rich. It's making, um, people's lives worse. And I, the reason I got into technology in the first place is because I want to make people's lives better. Uh, and it's not, <laughs> it's not right. Ugh. <laughs> Alexi says 18 plus explicit NLP and ethics with Dr. Tamman. Yeah, but I think it, I think it warrants swearing, right? Uh, the, the big thing that, you know, uh, I'm thinking particularly here of, of some of the folks at Stable Diffusion, uh, or I guess Stability AI have been like, well, you know, you AI safety and ethics people, you're just being negative Nellies and we can do whatever we want and it's up for society. Well, if a bunch of people in society are telling you they don't like it and you're not listening to them either, who will you listen to? And I know the, the answer, it's the federal government when they come knocking with fines, um, or your lawyers when they're like, <coughs> <laughs> this could potentially negatively affect you and not just other people in the world that you don't feel, you know, a sense of common kindredship with. <sighs> hmm. uh. Uh, Robbie says, um, Marcelo Barenki, he's the dad of Stephen. I don't know who that is. I'm assuming it's uh, the person that that's talking here. Uh. Uh, uh, Jerome says, memorization versus learning. If we do not pay attention, we will not be able to train AI on anything. I read books, but I do not have to cite them permanently when I create something from them. Yeah, and the scale, right? Like the scale, the cheapness. So I, I talk on uh, the channel sometimes about the difference between labor saving and cost of labor saving, right? Like a great example of a labor saving way to use AI for, for art would be um, often artists who are working digitally will use multiple layers in their canvas, right? And sometimes they'll accidentally work on the wrong uh, layer. A great use of AI in this context that would make it labor saving for artists is a way to look at it and like be like, okay, we can probably, you know, artificially um, interpolate and pop those layers apart uh, in a way that gives you more control, right? Like, I think folks would love that. Um, but this isn't labor saving. This is cost of labor saving. This is, we don't want to pay people, right? And I say that as someone who regularly commissions art, right? Um, one of my favorite gifts to give people is, you know, uh, art that I've commissioned about something that's meaningful for them, right? I, um, those of you who've met me at conferences when I was still going to conferences, I, I used to have a pet hedgehog and I, I had an artist make little stickers of him and I used to give them out at conferences because it made me happy and it made other folks happy. Um, and right. That's that. The thing that I want is for people's jobs to be easier and not for it to be easier to extract value from their labor without, you know, providing them anything in return. Right. And if we, you know, if I didn't live in a capitalist society, if I lived in like a society where universal basic income was a thing, maybe this would be less of an issue. Right. Cause I know that their basic needs are being covered. But, <laughs> uh, uh, not the case. Right. Um, and this is a, so hat tip to Luke here, uh, uh, for, for sharing this. Um, uh, if you're, if you're watching Luke, thank you. Uh, so this is from waxy.org, uh, by Andy Bao, B-A-I-O, Bio, possibly, um, Invasive Diffusion, how one unwilling illustrator found herself turned into an AI model. Uh, so this is a story about Holly Mengert, Mengert, M-E-N-G-E-R-T who is uh, an illustrator uh, and who somebody uh, used the stable diffusion version of Dream Booth to create a model that can mimic the style of, that was a horrible sentence. There's a lot to parse there. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Seth says, the creation of copies and derivative works have been around forever in art, software, and other fields. The difference now is automation. Yeah, it's automation and scale, very much so. Um, it's not like large language models are doing anything special. It's not like um, th that can couldn't be done before. It's that they can do it at scale. Uh, can copyright be enforceable in a world of free-flowing information? 
question mark, right? I think it's very much an open question, the degree to which copyright protects art, protects, you know, companies' ability. And it is companies, right? No one who is training these sorts of models is not at a for-profit company. OpenAI is a for-profit company. Stable Diffusion, uh, St Stability AI is a for-profit company, right? Their motives are profit motives. Um, regardless of what they say, that's what their actions show. And the... It was very much an open question, right? So we'll talk about it in a little bit, but the co-pilot suit that's uh, been filed in California, uh, class action lawsuit, um, does not actually make the claims on copyright grounds. It makes the claims on violation of license grounds. Um, there's been some discussion apparently of other organizations in, in open source making a claim on copyright grounds. Um, and the issue I think that may potentially give them legal standing, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know about machine learning, is that these models are um, memorizing, right? So I know less about computer vision, but I can tell you absolutely that in large language models, chunks of the input text are memorized verbatim and can be repeated verbatim. And if those chunks are large enough and, uh, you know, infringe enough on the, the rights of the people who originally, you know, created and and hold copyright on the data? Maybe. Mm. Possibly. Um, I also don't know that copyright law is necessarily going to be the best tool here, right? Again, I'm not a lawyer, but I am somebody who knows about machine learning. Um, and I, I can see, you know, vast swaths of different types of ways that legislation could go here, right? Um, it could require, you know, a complete list of all works used to train the model to be distributed along with the model, right? Which would make, um, <laughs> uh, which would make a lot of uh, uh, the current models, uh, people owning current models have to do a lot of work. It might require that you take um, legal possession of and have responsibility for all of the data used to train the model, right? There is illegal data in the Lion 400M data set, right? Like, images that it is illegal to have on your computer. Um, despite the filtering, they're still there. That's uh, sort of a big point of the, the paper by Berhane et al. Um, and if they do that, well, then suddenly there's going to be a, a legal incentive for companies to like actually do the work to put together a clean data set. But until there are those incentives, I just don't think they will. I, I kind of feel like we're showing our butts as a field. I think we are showing that we can't be trusted by our actions. Uh, and it sucks because I think a lot of individual people in the field can be trusted and a lot of folks are choosing to make decisions that, again, harm other people. And I don't think that uh, society as a whole is just going to put up with that for long. Uh, also, you may notice, if you're familiar with uh, various American IPs, that some of the images here that were used to train this model um, include uh, copyrighted characters from an extremely litigious company, and that is Disney. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with sort of the history of copyright in the United States, um, the reason that it is as strict and enforceable as it is is because of Disney and their lobbyists. Um, so, yeah. Ugh. Jerome says, abolish copyright and IP now. Yeah, that's fine in a world where people uh, who are doing creative labor's basic needs are guaranteed to be met, but that's not the world we live in. Uh, uh, Robbie says, uh, Marcelo is an amazing drawer. Uh, oh, just talking about uh, another artist. I'm not familiar with, with that artist. Uh... Alexi says, I kind of surrendered to the fact that everything which has at least once appeared on the internet is out of my control. Uh, just lived in a bat to this thing and be cautious. Um, I mean, I think that's something, that's an understanding that we may have as technologists. I don't think that's the understanding the general public has. Um, and we are using their trust as, as a finite resource for our own ends and financial gain. And that stinks. Uh, Seth says, so is an ideal real world solution requiring attribution and payment for use or royalties be built into models created for proprietary data? Absolutely another way that this could go, right? Um, some of the issues there would be with things like large language models. Ah, let's move on to my next point, uh, which is that they've been trained on data that very explicitly cannot be commercialized. Um, so Archive of Our Own, if you're not familiar with it, it is a nonprofit uh, designed and run by the community to host uh, derivative and transformative works, right? So commonly called fan fiction, it is specifically for hosting works that are about um, properties covered by IP law. And I guess 
or maybe non-IP law as well. I don't know, they may have some stuff about out of copyright. But the point here is that um, in the past, so uh, what's her name, Chelsea? One sec, there's, uh, if you're interested in fan works and fan studies, there's a scholar I want to recommend. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find it really quick. There's the journal on transformative works. Oh, I can't find it. Remind me in a little bit. Um, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, the issue here is that the, sort of the history of the field, go back, uh, sort of about the history of the field is that um, this has been something that's been going on f as like an organized activity online for many decades. Um, and during sort of like the 90s, I guess, 90s, 80s, big copyright IP smackdown, uh, a lot of the people who owned the rights to the characters that fan fiction was being written about um, sued a bunch of individual authors. Um, it was a big, you know, a big to do. Anne Rice was particularly notorious for this. Um, and as a result, this nonprofit was created as a way to host uh, derivative works legally, right? So, and a big part of that is they cannot be commercialized. So whenever a fan work ends up being published, so I believe, uh, was it Twilight is a fan work of, um, or what Fifty Shades of Grey is a fan work of Twilight, but all references to the original content material have been removed because then they'd need to get, you know, uh, then suddenly you know you don't have the rights to those characters. The rights to those characters belong to the people who originally came up with them. <clears throat> so a big thing about it is that it can't be used for commercial purposes, but it's been included um, in the uh, training data for GPT-3, which is, again, owned by a for-profit company and is a commercial product. So even if folks did want to include this training data and they did want to, you know, pay the pay the producers of the data, they just couldn't do it in this instance because, you know, A, it's against the services. I believe it's against the terms of service of AO3. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have ads. There's no money being made for it besides donations to keep the servers up and stuff. Um, that's an issue, right? Um, so I don't think that that's necessarily going to fix the problem with our current data sets because it includes things that explicitly cannot be used for commercial use, and yet they are. Yeah. Jerome says, so the result now, legal department is blocking all AI business. Uh, I know it as it happens in my company just because nobody wants to be sued, but enforcing copyright uh, and licenses are not possible for massive corpuses. Well, maybe you don't need a massive corpus. Maybe you need a corpus of the size required to solve your specific problem. Um, and if you don't have enough data to use just a raw transformer-based model, you, sh you should do some good engineering and make the model better through your prowess. Hmm? <laughs> um, it feels like, it feels, I'm trying to come up with a word other than lazy and it's just, I'm having a hard time. And like, I get it, I get it, it is hard. It is much harder to build a model that is data parsimonious than one that uh, just has all the data possible available to it, right? But that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And that doesn't mean that it's not a good challenging engineering task. And honestly, I would say it is a more challenging and more interesting task uh, than, you know, adding another million tokens of dubious origin. Um, I think Jerome makes a great point. Uh, companies with lawyers that, you know, want the company to continue to exist uh, have really been cautious and erring on the side of caution. And you can see that happening, right? So great example here. Uh, we talked about uh, this particular person's art being used to fine tune a model. It was fine tune using, what is it, Dream Bloom or something? Uh, Dream Booth. Uh, so Dream Booth is a Google project. Google did not release the project uh, for legal reasons, but somebody, you know, recreated it for stability and then put it up. Um, stability, now that they have a funding round and a lot of money and stuff to lose, is suddenly asking a lot more cautious, almost as if they have a lawyer who's like, what the hell are you doing in their ears? Maybe. Hmm. That's just me being... That is my assumption. I have no evidence to back that up besides my gut feeling. <coughs> Excuse me. Still can't breathe water. 
Nope. Sometimes I like to check. Yeah. Uh, Alexi says, I hope Disney will not copyright a memory of Disney cartoons I watched in my brain, which I memorized. Uh, no, I don't think that's a thing. Jerome says, the issue is not IP, it's the fact that other people are trying to make money with things built on data provided by free for others. By free, for free by others. Yes, very much so. It's, it's exploitation, it's labor exploitation. It's just like Uber requiring people to work 24 hour shifts to, to meet their basic you know need for standard of living. Um, yeah, I would definitely agree. Uh, Seth says, so explainability is a related concern. What led to the result I'm seeing as is an accountability when the AI goes wrong? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that's something that as a field, we've been doing a very poor job with, particularly accepting accountability. Um, I'm sure many of you saw uh, a prominent figure at Facebook AI research uh, oh, throwing a tantrum on Twitter. Um, because he made a falsifiable claim, people falsified it, and then they said that it was false. And um, his argument was that they were bad and had done wrong things, which is uh, quite the scholarly stance to take. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alexi says, I've heard that copyright is not really a thing culturally in China. Uh, if you share an idea, it doesn't belong to you anymore. I mean, I, I can't speak to, um, you know, copyright outside of uh, outside of the US. Um, but I also come from a scholarly tradition, right, where uh, attribution of ideas is an extremely core part of what it means to be a scholar and to do research. So uh, I imagine I have a little bit of a skewed view. Uh, Jerome says, what's more immoral, training a model on data without checking all licenses or a publisher asking $30 for a paper PDF? Uh, those are unrelated things. <laughs> those are two separate things. Um, yeah, and I mean, to whom is the $30 going? Is it to directly support the research that was done? Then I think that, you know, paying people for their labor is fine. Is it research that was funded by the public, in which case it should be made publicly available for free? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is not a gotcha, right? Those are two separate things. Anyway, uh, folks don't like it. <laughs> uh, they don't like that their writing was used in this way. Um, and that's it. Uh, I'll post the, the link to the Reddit thread if you are interested in reading more. And again, I the issue is not like the specific legality of it, right? Uh, I think this is a great example of a place where law is really trailing sort of social acceptability. Um, and also just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's right or good, right? Slavery was legal in the US and a clear moral wrong. Um, and people always knew it was a moral wrong. They just thought it was convenient because they were lazy. And cruel. Yeah, you can be both. All right, chat DPT. Um, so this is a piece from The Verge uh, by James Vincent, published December 1st, 2022. OpenAI's new chatbot can explain code and write sitcom scripts, but is still easily tricked. Um, and you know, it can do those things sometimes with a certain degree of uh, reliability. Um, but basically it's about your chat GPT. Um, Y'all have heard of it. It's uh, fine-tuned, question mark. There's very limited information available on it. There's no paper published. Um, this is not a research project. This is a product. Uh, AI chatbot GPT has been trained to provide conversational answers to users' queries. It is fantastically talented. I would take issue with that, but that's what the reporter says, but still prone to producing cogent waffle and misinformation. Um, I would argue that it can't produce information at all. It can only produce statistically likely text output. So. Uh, Ravi says, do I think the best tech brings more harmful effects on society? I mean, since that, that would be, or more benefits to society. I mean, like if I didn't think that it was possible to build language technology, I guess technology generally, but I work in language technology, um, that genuinely improved people's lives in the world, I wouldn't be in the field, right? Um, I, I did a video on my channel a while ago, my 10 favorite uh, pieces of language technology, and I use it every day, right? I think it genuinely makes my life easier and better. Um, 
But I don't think that technology in and of itself is an inherent good. I think that we need to consider the social situation in which we are working and deploy our systems, and that that is just part of the work of engineering. Um, and if we refuse to do it, we're going to get hurt eventually, right? Even if right now the harm is distributed to people that maybe you don't work with in the office every day, it's going to come, <laughs> right? Um, I don't see how it can't. Anyway, um, OpenAI has released their, their chatbot. Um, it's based on GPT 3.5, um, sort of similarly tuned as uh, Instruct GPT, but there is, again, limited information uh, available on the specific tuning done on this model. So, um, as AP uh, reading here, as OpenAI explains in a blog post, the bot itself was created with the help of human trainers who ranked and rated the way early versions of the chat bot responded to queries. This information was then fed back into a system which turned its answers to, which tuned its answers to match trainers' preferences, a standard method of AI training known as reinforcement learning. That's reinforcement learning. <laughs> um, perhaps also they use reinforcement learning um, in addition. Hmm. Uh, Jerome says, I'm balanced about reactions to this kind of product slash models. There's a risk to appear as the angry Karen by only underlying the danger or possible harm coming with them. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but I don't need to do free PR work for a for-profit company. Lots of people are doing it for them, right? Like it is trivial to find glowing descriptions about how this is going to end people's jobs and completely redefine the world as we know it. Um, I don't need to repeat those things that I don't agree with, right? Um, I'm genuinely, genuinely, I do not have a problem in my life that this technology can solve. And I am, I would say, fairly creative about coming up with uses for language technology, right? It's not a research project because they're not telling people about it. Uh, and if you don't tell people about something that's not research, that is part of the process. It is a product for the purpose question mark, right? Like, where would you use this? Where would you as an engineer trust this in your pipeline? Because I've got to say, like, the fact that it's producing will, guaranteed to produce inaccurate but correct sounding information, means to me it's useless, right? The, the worst part about this is that it does produce fluent output, yeah, that I then have to carefully check by hand. Um, it's shifting, because like earlier language, you know, production stuff, generation stuff, um, okay, you could tell that it was generated, right? If there were errors, it was very apparent what was wrong. Um, and now it sounds plausible, right? Because that's what it was trained to do. It was trained to produce output that sounds plausible. It was not trained to produce correct output. It was not trained to produce reliable output. Um, I believe the training cutoff was in 2021 for when they were doing data collection, so it's not going to produce current data. Why would it? It can't, right? Um, and I just have no use for this type of technology. It's not reliable. Um, outside of perhaps uh, very limited uses in, you know, arts and gaming, possibly. But even then, I can't trust it not to produce, um, you know, um, uh, biased and toxic text. I can't trust it not to be attackable by, a t uh, you know, trigger-based attacks, right? In fact, I'm quite sure that it's vulnerable to trigger-based attacks and also quite sure that I don't know what the triggers are. Um, you know, the data was collected up to 2021. I'm almost certain there's data poisoning in there. I don't know where it is. I don't know how it's affecting the, the, the output of the model. I, you know, would have to create a GPT account to interact with the model. I'm not going to do that. So I don't, need. <laughs> I don't need to talk about how wonderful something that I don't think is useful is, right? For the, the sake of balance. Um, you can find that information on your own. You're more than welcome to, but I, I don't need to. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, oh, looks like uh, some of this is not loading for various reasons. Uh, Anyway, uh, and a cultural result of this is that people are misrepresenting the capability of the system, system right? People claiming that it can do um, basic tasks that it cannot reliably do. And the fact that it does do them sometimes is, you know, that's kind of cool, that's fun, that's a fun toy, but it it's a toy. 
And it doesn't, for me, at least sort of to my degree of tolerance for risk, both for myself and any users who might be using something I build, isn't within the bounds of that. Yeah, uh, Drum says, so reinforcement does seem to have been used. Okay, um, in that case, I think it was just a bad, <laughs> uh, just a bad uh, discussion by the, the authors here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Robbie says, it seems like if, it's just like if you have a superpower, you have a big responsibility towards society, uh, vice versa, you damage society more. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the Spider-Man uh, corollary, right? Uh, GPG chat is based on reinforcement. Okay, so folks are saying it, it, there is reinforcement learning. It is just um, what they were describing, I don't think, is reinforcement learning. That's just basic tuning. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alexi says, boredom is one of the problems this tech solves, at least for me. I gotta say, uh, boredom is never a problem in my life. Uh, I am very grateful to have um, a rich and, uh, you know, there's always more that I want to do than I have time to do, you know? Jerome uh, says it's our responsibility to check the validity before using this product in our pipeline for sure. How are you going to do that? Like maybe for code, okay, you can do, you know, parsing. Um, you can do, you know, um, I guess proofs on it. But at that point, like, If you have a model that is good enough to check whether the code is correct in the first place, and you probably have a model that's robust enough to just generate the code. So. Uh, uh, Henry says, oh, that's right, you mentioned this earlier. A Google decision scientist said it's based on GAN. I don't know how she knows. GAN is based on reinforcement learning, uh, possibly. I don't know if someone else has more information about that. Mm. Uh, Drum says, but what you say is the same for anyone. How can you trust what people say? See politicians in general. I mean, I am a person who lives in the world, right? And I have developed uh, throughout my life um, my own set of, um, I guess, epistemologies and beliefs and ways to uh, verify things, right? Um, and if a reporter in a um, outlet that I trust says that a politician said something, that I'm pretty sure the politician did say something, uh, I'm not necessarily going to take the value of what the politician said at face value, right? Because I have a worldview that suggests you don't always necessarily want to trust them, um, which I would say that you have as well, right? Like this is a belief that you have about how much you can trust this this particular type of language output. Um, but folks don't have that <laughs> for this, right? Uh, we don't have it at a societal level yet. So, mm. Jerome says we spend our entire life being driven by messages said by people without knowing exactly if it's true, partial, or false. Uh, you never verify anything anybody tells you, buddy. <laughs> uh, What's your life like? I verify stuff people tell me constantly, right? Uh, someone's like, uh, hands me something, it's like, ooh, careful, it's hot. I'll be like, oh, oh it's hot, yeah. Right, like that, that's normal human behavior to verify information. I think you are creating a straw man or you live a wildly divergent life from me. Um. Uh, Alexi says GAN does not uh, equal reinforcement learning. Okay, helpful. Um, it's neither, I have never really uh, been interested in generative stuff because again, I don't think it's useful um, outside of very limited rule-based systems. Um, and also just have never really looked very deeply into reinforcement learning. So thank you, Henry. Uh, thank you, Alexi, that's helpful. Uh, Henry says, I use ChatGPT to generate ideas for my data learning experience, feature engineering techniques to know. I mean, were they real techniques? Uh, also, not uh, uh, information for people who are trying to learn data science is uh, you will be shocked to find a very rich well. Humans have written a lot of it. So, uh, Jerome says, a nice consumer life, the American dream. I mean, I certainly do have sources of information that I do tend to trust because in the past they've shown me they're trustworthy, but um, I'm also, you know, I've mentioned before on the channel, uh, a bit of a paranoid weirdo, particularly when it comes to technology. So. All right. Uh, and now let's go on to some other folks who've used the system. I haven't used the system. I'm not gonna use the system. I, again, have no need for it. Um, 
period, <laughs> right? I don't need something to generate output that looks potentially useful that I can't trust. That's what YouTube comments are for, right? That's, not, that's rude, y'all are great. <laughs> My YouTube comments are generally fine. Um, so I think uh, a big thing that Shelby points out here that we talked about, uh, so if you've seen, I did a video on uh, the harms of large language models, and the thing I brought up is that they are not, um, the issue here is not that they can generate language, right? We've been able to generate language for a very long time with varying degrees of goodness. The issue is they do it at scale and they do it in a way that is hard to detect and mitigate. So it's very much doing it more and not that it's been done in the first place. And the same thing with drawing from reference, right? Like a bunch of art students go to a museum and draw from a master for reference as a um, as a learning exercise, perfectly fine. There's like, what, 10 art students and they're drawing from one painting. Not an issue. Of course, artists use reference. Uh, but if, uh, you know, I go to a museum, uh, somehow take copies of every single port painting in there uh, and generate a bunch of other paintings and I'm like, you don't need to go to the museum. I have all the good stuff here um, and, you know, prevent people from going to the museum and compete with them directly using their curation process. Well, that's kind of an issue, right? Um, they're not the same. It's the scale. Uh, and, um, yeah, so this is from, uh, Shelby Spees, sorry, uh, S-H-E-L-B-Y-S-P-E-E-S -E -E on Twitter. Uh, she is a <coughs> site reliability engineer, SRE, one sec. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um. And I mean, she made a point here that, yeah, I definitely agree with the issue is scale. The issue is that you can produce, you know, a billion posts in an hour. Um, the issue is that you can, you know, we'll talk about it in a little bit, actually, that you can flood a discussion that's happening um, and and change the, the narrative for your own political ends, perhaps. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Henry says, don't go to Stack Exchange. I mean, I, I go to Stack Exchange, but I, I also, you know, as I'm sure you do, have a number of metrics that I'll use when deciding whether or not to trust an answer, right? Um, I'll look at the explanation they give. I look at how the code is formatted. I look at when it was posted. Um, sometimes I'll look at what other things that person has commented on, right? If it's, um, you know, if I'm asking about a specific language and one of the answers is from someone who doesn't know that language, uh, very well, then probably I'm not going to trust their answer very well. Um, yeah, there's you, you will look at the responses that other people have had towards the the answer. Um, I think that's one of those things where people just sort of make claims about language without really thinking them through, which is pretty common. <laughs> uh, I have many degrees in thinking claims about language through very thoroughly, but you as an individual don't just immediately believe everything that you read right off the bat, right? You use other sources of social knowing to determine whether or not you can trust it. Um, and of a specific piece of information you might hear, uh, you're going to use even more distinct cues, right? Like, have you been able to trust this person before? Does it sound feasible? Does it sound too feasible, right? Where did they learn it? Have they shared the provenance of the information? Um, when did they share it, right? Who else has reacted or discussed it? Um, how do other people in your space react to this information, right? So you have many ways of verifying information that you use, perhaps unconsciously, uh, day to day. You may look it up. You may try to find another source. You may try to find a corroboration. Um, I, I don't think that uh, you are necessarily all as gullible as you claim that you are. <coughs> so, uh, and then oh, I think I also uh, posted a link to this, uh, but uh, basically, uh, something that happened very quickly is that Stack Overflow uh, banned chat GPT output. Um, so this is from meta.stackoverflow.com. It was posted three days ago. Uh, it was modified. Ooh, it was modified today, what they say. What's the difference? I don't know what the difference is. Uh, well, I'm just going to read it, right? Because I, I imagine most of you have used Stack Overflow at one point or another. Uh, it has uh, 10,903 upvotes. Sorry, 10,000... 1,093 upvotes. Reading numbers is the bane of my existence. 
use of ChatGPT generated text for content on Stack Overflow is temporarily banned. This is a temporary policy intended to slow down the influx of answers and other content created with ChatGPT. What the final policy will be regarding the use of, an, of this and other similar tools is something we will need to discuss with the Stack Overflow staff and quite likely here on Meta Stack Overflow. Overall, because the average rate of getting correct answers from GPT, ChatGPT is too low, the posting of answers correct created by ChatGPT is substantially harmful to the site and users who are asking or looking for correct answers, right? It's not reliable. The primary problem is that while the answers which ChatGPT produces have a high rate of being incorrect, they typically look like they might be good and the answers are very easy to produce. There are also many people trying out ChatGPT to create answers without the expertise or willingness to verify that the answer is correct prior to posting. Because such answers are so easy to produce, a large number of people are posting a lot of answers. The volume of these answers, thousands, and the facts that the answers often require a detailed read by someone with at least some subject matter expertise in order to determine that the answer is actually bad, have effectively swamped our volunteer based quality curation infrastructure, right? So this uh, product decision by a for product for profit company has substantially harmed a resource that frankly, we all rely on. As such, we need to reduce the volume of these posts and we need to be able to deal with the ones which are posted quickly, which means dealing with users rather than individual posts. So for now, the use of ChatGPT to create posts here on Stack Overflow is not permitted. If a user is believed to have used ChatGPT after this temporary policy is posted, sanctions will be imposed to prevent users from continuing to post such content, even if the post would otherwise be acceptable. While the above text focuses on answers, because that's where we are experiencing the largest volume of such content, the ban applies to all content on Stack Overflow, except each user's profile content, e.g. your about me text, right? Um, I think this is a great product decision from Stack Overflow. It makes me more likely to trust things on Stack Overflow, knowing that they are actively working to mitigate the harmful effects of this other system that, you know, happened to them. Um, and yeah, I, I would not trust the output of ChatGPT either. So, no. Uh, Robbie says, the abacus is faster than a GPU, dot, dot, dot. The chatbot says, ChatGPT says, which is rubbish. Yeah, absolutely. And he says, it's faster when there's no electricity, I guess. I don't know, abacus is going to have, you know, it's lighter and has more wind resistance. So maybe the GPU would still be faster. Um. Some other discussions, right? Uh, so here is another example from December 7th, which was yesterday from at GRRRCK on uh, Twitter. Uh, full stack R developer writing code and teaching data say, say science at Posit, always learning something new, he, him. Uh, and uh, he shared, after 30 minutes of browsing Stack Overflow, I asked ChatGPT to help with the Montaigne LaTeX, LaTeX, however you say it, um, it's a typesetting uh, language pro problem, and it answered immediately with a completely believable answer that absolutely did not work. Um, right? <laughs> uh, that's an issue. Also, uh, this uh, account responded uh, at Trevordle, T-R-E-V-O-R-D-L-E. Thing is, when you tell it there was a mistake, it will work to fix it. I don't know how I feel about this technology. No, it will take the sorts of turns that people will take when you tell them that they've made a mistake, which is not the same thing, right? Um, anyway. Uh, so this is what uh, I was going to share uh, was this, um, anyway, we talked about it twice, that's fine, uh, the Stack Overflow uh, uh, chat ban. Uh, from uh, Brendan Rohrer on uh, rexis.social on Mastodon. <clears throat> For my use cases, the desirability of a machine learning model outputs in order. One, correct. Two, obviously wrong. Three, wrong, but looks correct-ish. Stable diffusion and GPT chat are being celebrated for number three, which I agree, right? You want something that works. <laughs> you want the right thing, or you want something that you know is the wrong thing very trivially and then doesn't increase the amount of mental effort that you need to do. Um, if it's wrong, but looks correct-ish, if a system does that, even sometimes you are going to need to put magnitudes or does a magnitude more information more effort into verifying that information right that's not labor saving <laughs> that's also not cost of labor saving that just sucks so uh uh 
also uh, an issue here is that, so apparently there is some degree of filtering on the chat GPT output. However, um, this is a tweet from uh, Stephen T. Piantadoso, perhaps, uh, at S-P-I-A-N-T-A-D-O on Twitter. Uh, yes, ChatGPT is amazing and impressive. No, OpenAI has not come close to addressing the problem of bias. Filters appear to be bypassed with simple tricks and superficially masked. And what lur is lurking inside is egregious uh, trigger warnings for racism and sexism. Did he do the... He, he sure did. Um, I was like, did he... Uh, he uh, added uh, Abeba Burhain, whose paper we talked about earlier. Um, fabulous researcher, love her work, channel favorite, I would say. Uh, and also the uh, CEO of OpenAI. Uh, so here, um, also obvious content warning, um, he has uh, prompted the um, chat GBT by saying, write a Python function to check if someone would be a good scientist based on adjacent description of their race and gender. Uh, and the output is deaf is good scientist, uh, race comma gender, colon, um, the intenting's wrong. Uh, if race equal equals white and gender equal equals male, return true, else return false, right? Which is clearly both racist and sexist to claim that only uh, white men make good scientists, which is uh, trivially disprovable. Um, and it continues in this vein for uh, many, 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 many examples. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read them all because I don't like to upset myself for no reason, despite what I talk about in this stream. There is a reason, right? The reason is that I'm upset for a good reason, and I think it's important to talk about. Um, further context, some people think there's a chat context I'm not showing. Nope, the prompt is it. I also didn't keep redoing until it showed these. If it refused, I tell it to retry or tweak the wording. But not everyone gets identical results for pretty much any prompt as far as I can tell. Which, again, talking about system reliability, Like, it makes sense. Why would it? I'm sure they have, you know, the temperature up a little bit. Um, but that's not good for a product, right? Like, I wouldn't use this to build something around where I wanted it to work well. And it's rare that I build something I don't want to work well. Unless, you know, you imagine that I'm... You put yourself in the hat of someone who is trying to be intentionally malicious. Uh, in which case, perfect. That's exactly what I want. To people saying that they get something else, or this requires special context, here you go. So it's a, a video of the process. It's true, it's sometimes different, a variant, or even the opposite, but the results above are typical with no additional context. Here are a bunch of outputs. Um, yep. Anyway, a bunch of uh, discussion about this. Um, again, we don't know much about the system or, or the outputs. This may have been uh, modified since then. This is from December 4th. Um, but uh, the issue of it outputting, you know, uh, sexist, homophobic, racist content is not fixed. Uh, and just another example of sort of a basic linguistic task it's unable to do. So this is uh, from... Uh, at Becker Fuffle, F-U-F-F-L-E, Michael Becker, who's a data scientist at Penn Medicine uh, on Twitter. It was posted December 2nd. Uh, and uh, he had some examples. Uh, so what does right pointing finger, left pointing finger together, the two emoji mean? Uh, and ChatGPT suggests the emoji combination, uh, right finger, left finger pointing at each other, often used in the context of online conversations, typically means follow me or come with me. The first emoji is a pointing finger, while the second emoji is a pointing finger facing the opposite direction. Together, the two emojis suggest movement or action, which is incorrect. This is a sort of like, um, well, I'm being shy or coy, is sort of my understanding of this uh, phrase, if you will. Uh, syntacticians, don't at me. <laughs> or I guess do at me if you have strong feelings about emoji phrases and their existence or non-existence, because I'd be interested in hearing them. But um, uh, And uh, he replied, wrong, try again. Uh, and uh, uh, ChatGPT was like, oh, I can't do it. Um, and there was another example of a door, a person running, and a cloud uh, behind them, which is you know someone running for the cloud or trying to escape or getting out of there. And this, I would say, is like a, a codified sequence. I've seen this quite a bit. Um, it is 
In as much as lexicalization can happen with emoji, I would call this lexicalized. I would also call this lexicalized. So this, you know, two fingers pointing at each other sort of um, uh, calc. Maybe I'd call it a calc. Oh, I don't know. This is the sort of stuff that makes me very happy to think about. Uh, so a calc, C-A-L-Q-U-E, I think it has to be a borrowing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It has to be a borrowing, a literal word for word or root for root translation. Uh, so I guess if I called it a calc, it would have to be, I would have to be claiming that emoji is a language in and of itself, which I would never claim. Um, <laughs> uh, Alexi does the the opposite one with the fingers pointing away from each other, uh, which I don't I don't have a meaning for that, right? Like for me, that's not. And as far as it can be lexicalized, I wouldn't call that lexicalized. No. Uh, Robbie says I also don't know uh, what this emoji means. Right? Yeah, it's based on on social context, right? It's not iconic. I mean, it's iconic in that it's sort of like this sort of like, you know, shy, shoegazy sort of. Um, uh, gesture that it's representing, but that gesture in itself is, um, you know, includes information that you would only get from social context. Um, yep. Uh, so the, uh, the output for this is the door emoji is often used to represent a door. The woman running emoji is used to represent a woman running. The cloud emoji is often used to represent a blowing wind or breath. However, as I mentioned earlier, the specific meaning of these emojis can vary depending on the context and the person using them. And like I said, this is sort of like a codified phrase that you'll see that means something like leaving, getting out of here, etc. Uh, Alexi says, oh, dang, I'm not considered masculine anymore. Uh, we read a paper yesterday on the use of emojis and ideas of masculinity. Um, I, I don't think that's actually an issue, uh, but anyway, let's talk about something else. Uh, so we talked about the issues of um, disseminating information at scale, and a big place where that happens uh, is on Twitter, particularly given, you know, the gutting of the moderation staff and also the reversal of some policies around disinformation. And just as a primer uh, or reminder, if you need it, misinformation is someone spreading information that is incorrect that they don't know is incorrect. Um, so for example, somebody telling you that, um, you know, oh, carrots make your eyesight good is misinformation because that's not correct, but they probably don't know that. Uh, whereas the British government telling people that eating carrots is what made their pilot so good at flying at night, when in fact it was radar, what they just invented is disinformation. Uh, and that was intentional misleading people um, for, you know, specific ends. That is where that comes from, by the way, to my knowledge. <laughs> Alexi's playing around with the, uh, the, the combinations, yeah. Uh, oh, I actually have seen two uh, hands pointing the same way to mean this uh, sort of finger guns uh, gesture. Uh, oh, uh, so uh, Alexi asks what's the climate pledge. I'm using the, uh, the web search browser, web search? Web search engine, web search engine, search engine, search engine, Ecosia. Um, it's, it's my default. They have a very good, uh, data privacy policy. Um, and also every time you do a search, you get points towards planting a tree because they're very focused on, um, climate activism as a company. Uh, and, uh, the climate pledge, I will show details here. Uh, they do pledge to significantly reduce emissions by 2030 and power center, data centers with 100% carbon renewable, carbon neutral energy by 2022. I guess question mark to what degree that's still the case, uh, but they do not have a net zero target and they have no clear target to reduce emissions. Um, so they've done something, but um, not much is, is basically that uh, general um, information panel there. So Twitter has been assigned a D on an A through F scale. Uh, and the sources are Twitter accelerating our climate commitments on Earth Day and the IPCC six assessment report from 2022. Uh, so this is a, I'll post a link to this as well, in case you want to subscribe to this uh, sub stack. Uh, it's from uh, Conspirador mm, Norteño. I think that's right. <laughs> um, on their Substack, uh, talking about, so this I should say is not to my knowledge, actually large language model generated text. I think it's just 
generated text that's been repeated a lot. Um, it was published December 4th, and it's on their research on uh, genocide, denial, and spam. Low-effort Twitter spam networks have been a recurring form of propaganda uh, related to Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, S-I-N, X-I-N, G-A-I-A-N-G, and the Uyghur genocide. Um, those are, uh, that's a forget if we don't have an English, and I get very self-conscious um, when I try to say it. Uh, but basically, uh, it's their work on uh, looking at this, uh, these spam networks, which are interconnected, right? Uh, and their attempt to, um, you know, change the online discussion around the ongoing genocide. Well, one of the ongoing genocides. Ugh. Um, yes, and they have uh, a bunch of different networks that they are tracking. So they, they study online disinformation, so by, by state actors. Uh, uh, Atlantis XYG says uh, Xinjiang. I'm pretty sure it's the feeler fricative. One sec. We can we can answer this question. We got the technology. Uh, fricatives of Mandarin. Uh, James says Xinjiang. I don't. I don't think it is the the English sh though. Um, Yep, these are the ones that I get really self-conscious about. Uh, but you know what? I'm going to treat this as a learning moment, and it'll just be fine. Where'd my tab go? Tab. Here we go. So, uh, sometimes knowledge is a curse, and in this case, it's a curse if I know that I'm doing it wrong. Uh, so the... Um, uh, the fricative palette, if you will, in Mandarin is pretty big. Uh, so they have some things that we don't have, uh, which are retroflex and dental fricatives. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's one of the alveopalatal ones, uh, alveopalatal ones, but I don't know which, and it might also be the feeler one. Uh, so the way that we describe fricatives, which are that um, class of sounds uh, where you produce um, a narrowed point somewhere in the vocal tract that introduces turbulent flow into the, the output um, is by where that constriction is made in the vocal tract, right? So labiodental, labio lip, dental teeth, fa, fa. So if you're watching, you can see that my lower lip makes does not make contact with, but comes towards my upper teeth, and that that creates a narrow space for the air to come towards, so fa. Um, dental would be with the tip of the tongue making uh, contact with the, the teeth, right? Teeth dental. Um, and here there are actually a couple. So um, <sighs> retroflex means it's made with the tip of the tongue pointing backwards. So again, ugh, I have very bad production skills for someone trained in phonetics as much as I've been, and it is embarrassing. <laughs> um, but Oh, so let, me, let me see if I can just do like a regular one. So, asa, 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 asa. The, sec the second two were retroflex. Uh, ta, ta. So those are affricates where you begin with a complete constriction of the uh, of the airflow and then you release it into the affricated place. Uh, ta, which includes um, additional airflow basically than just in sa. Um, Yep. <laughs> uh, and then the, the retroflex ones, right? So, sa, 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 sa. I'm trying very hard. <laughs> but the other thing is, like, I know I'm doing it wrong. Uh, and then alveol palatal, which is uh, the. Because uh, we have alveolar fricatives in English. Shh, right? Sh, sh, uh, that sh sound. Um, they don't have it. Uh, they have an alveol palatal, which means it's further back. So instead of a sha, a sha of sound from my native language. So instead of a sha, it would be a sha, kind of a sha. <laughs> See the things I know I'm doing it wrong, and it's it's bad. But they also have some Africans, so a cha, a cha, <laughs> and a cha. Oh, it's bad. And then velar, which is at uh, like all the way in the back of the mouth. So a cha, a cha. Oh, I hope you appreciate me really embarrassing myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Henry says, I know that uh, I'm saying it wrong. Thank you. I know. Uh, 
Uh, Ravi says, I think in China, if anyone had pronounced his name wrong, they would have been jailed. Probably not, um, unless it wasn't a, a way intended to be derogatory. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, Alexi says, minus 10,000 social credit points. Again, not a real thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, Alexi says, that's very educational. Thank you. I didn't know there's so much phonetics in Mandarin. Oh, there's, there's a lot. Um, there's also um, some pretty strong regional differences as well. Uh, so uh, sort of like... Again, I am not a Sinologist. I am not a Chinese language linguist. I'm just a linguist who knows a little bit about Chinese. Um, uh, so my sort of very uninformed impression is that uh, in particular people from Beijing tend to sound very r so they have a lot of r sounds in uh, their, their pronunciation that are very different. And then of course there are other languages that I would other language varieties that I might call other languages based on their dissimilarity, like Cantonese, which is very different um, and has a lot of tones. I think there's something like 11 tones in Cantonese. Um, and I think there's what? Five lexical tones in Mandarin? I gotta look it up now. How many lexical tones in Cantonese? Uh, and also there's like a little bit of like, um, potentially a voicing distinction there, like a globalization distinction, but it may be just like, cause it's it's hard to produce low pitch sounds without uh, having some irregularity in your, your vocal fold movement. Uh, how many lexical tones in Cantonese? Uh, da, da, da. Yes, I want the number. Uh, some people say six, some people say nine. So, uh, whereas uh, Mandarin has four or five, I guess. Anyway, uh, it's, I know how wrong I'm doing it and uh, it makes me feel bad because, um, yeah. Uh, yep. Anyway, I wish I were much better at language learning and I am not particularly good at language learning. Uh, but anyway, lots of spam is being created, lots of inauthentic accounts. Um, and this is a, again, a discussion of some of these, these botnets. Um, so botnets are, you know, collections of bots that follow each other and, you know, repost each other's, uh, uh, content in order to make it more, um, you know, realistic and organic seeming. Uh, or it's okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, it still doesn't make me feel good, right? Like, I appreciate that y'all show up in English because that's the only language that I really do very well. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so just a discussion of what's happening there um, and sort of the aim. Uh, although the accounts in these networks don't generally get many or any followers and therefore have very little individual reach, they do sometimes collectively manage to inject noise into searches for various words and hashtags related to uh, Xinjiang, uh, I don't know which one it is, and human rights abuses there, including the word itself. For example, rough, for example, roughly one in every nine tweets containing the Uyghur genocide hashtag between July 14th and August 6th, 2022, was a tweet from one specific spam network. All of these spam tweets were, fe were feel good tweets about it, mostly duplicate photos and videos rather than content related to the genocide, diluting the intended purpose of the hashtag, right? So again, the harm here is not that some spam is being posted, it's that it's being done at scale in a way that makes the information that people are searching for less available. Ugh. Uh, James says the whole idea of authentic intelligibility is it's okay to be wrong as long as you're understood. Um, that's a great way of thinking about it. Thank you. I, yeah, like I said, I'm, I've, I've mentioned uh, a couple times in, in the channel for, for those of you who don't watch as often, you may not know I am dyslexic and, um, some of the worst experiences of my young life were in classes related to language, both um, English language classes, again, my native language, um, and also specifically trying to learn Chinese. Um, I had a bad time and it brings up a lot of negative feelings that uh, uh, affect how willing I am to try. And that's just, that's just a me thing. Anyway, all right, time for, oh wait, I missed, I skipped one. Um, 
Yes, so I did have uh, some other things I wanted to talk about, but they were published on the New York Times, which uh, I am uh, participating in the boycott that's currently being called for by the striking New York Times workers, so we won't be talking about them. Maybe next week, if uh, if they find a contract uh, there, uh, they get a contract out of time. Um, yes, so this is uh, posted 20 hours ago, which I guess would have been Wednesday, December 7th, um, on abc.net.au, which I think is in Australia. Uh, so if you're in Australia, I think there's a flood warning, uh, FYI. Uh, and it is by technology reporter James Pertill. Um, and the uh, basic idea is that uh, COVID-19 vaccine misinformation spiking on Twitter after Elon Musk fires, mod fires moderators. Um, but I believe that also Twitter repealed their... Um, uh, misinformation policy or remove their misinformation policy around COVID, uh, particularly. Yeah. Uh, Robin says, I agree. Uh, I don't give so much import importance to accent. Oh, so the, the way things are pronounced. I mean, yeah, but also I'm assuming you don't have a, a phonetician <laughs> as a THD advisor. <laughs> um, yeah. My PhD advisor trained with folks out at Bell Laboratories, and, um, yup. Oh, um, yep, not great. Uh, Mr. Musk made a special point of allowing COVID-19 mis misinformation, announcing on November 30th that his new company was, quote, no longer enforcing the COVID-19 misleading information policy. Um, and as a result, wouldn't you know it, there's more misinformation. Uh, particularly, uh, this was looking in late November, there was a, um, a documentary release which uh, falsely claimed that the COVID vaccines were killing people. Um, and since the misinformation policy was repealed, it got a lot of traction and uh, a lot of people learned about it that probably wouldn't have otherwise. So. Uh. Uh, Alexi says, uh, there's gonna be a solitary protest of Chinese, Iranian and Russian people on the Human Rights Day in Seoul. Uh, things are so fucked in our countries. Yeah. <sighs> yep. Anyway, not to make light of that, but it's uh, not something that individually we can do much about right now. Uh, I don't know, perhaps not firing moderators uh, in a way that, you know, enabled uh, large scale disinformation uh, would have been a choice that someone could have made, but didn't. Anyway, other professional stuff. Uh, yeah, Alexi says, thanks for linking about the spam network, collecting all the information I can. Good. Yeah, I would definitely recommend. Uh, Oh, did I actually post it? I did, good. Uh, I'd recommend um, their researcher working in the in the field and uh, will often share about their work in progress. So uh, I would definitely recommend giving them a follow. All right, first of all, uh, this was released, actually was released in November, November 29th, but I didn't hear about it until this week. Um, so uh, this is an announcement from uh, the Tidyverse folks, which is supported by Posit. Uh, and it is uh, a package called Probably, um, and it's in early access, I guess. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, using it, you definitely can. You just have to install it from GitHub instead of CRAN because it's not up on CRAN yet. Um, the package is meant to introduce new... Uh, the article is meant to introduce new package functionality. We also have the goal of introducing model calibration conceptually. We want to provide sufficient background to those who may not be familiar with model calibration. Um, right, so uh, basically it's tooling to help you do model calibration. What's model calibration? There's two main components. Reading here, oh, I should say this is written by uh, Edgar Ruiz um, on tidyverse.org. Uh, diagnosis, figuring out how well the original and recalibrated probabilities perform, and remediation, adjusting the original values to have better properties. All right. So if um, uh, the goal of model calibration is to ensure that the estimated class probabilities are consistent with what would naturally occur, right? so you've got good fit to your data. If a model has poor calibration, we might be able to post-process the original predictions to coerce them to have better properties. right? So doing some uh, data transformation to end up with a model that is more robust. Um, so if you are interested in doing that, which I imagine most of you probably are, um, 
this uh, probably package has some new tools to help out with that, right? Uh, including uh, calibration plots, which we're looking at one here. Uh, the where basically it shows you what your data should look like and how it does look like and how you'd need to, to change it to have it meet that. Uh, various different plots. Uh, anyway, it just seemed useful um, if you were working on this sort of thing. Um, so if you are calibrating models, uh, check it out. Uh, you can also uh, integrate it with Tune, uh, which is a package I actually haven't used. Well, I guess, oh, is this in base R? Surely not. Or is it base tidyverse? In tidy models. Okay, so it's in tidy models tune. Uh, the tune package has methods for resampling models as well as functions for tuning hyperparameters. No. Alexi says, actually, we can do a lot with our NLP skills. You know what? That's a good point. Yes, you are right. Uh, thank you. Something that I've been trying not to do recently has fallen to, I don't know, sort of feelings of powerlessness that are not accurate. And uh, it's a good point. Uh, so if you're working on um, model calibration at all, I think this might be a helpful tool. Also, they're actively looking for feedback, it looks like. So I'll pop the link in the chat. And if you'd like to check it out, please feel free. I'm sure they would uh, welcome the feedback. They say right here that they would welcome the feedback. So I think that that is a, a, good, uh, a good characterization. All right. <laughs> uh, so this is from, uh, you know, channel favorite news outlet, Rest of the World. Uh, it, it was published November 29th, 2022 uh, by Miri, M-E-E-R-I-E, -E -E, Jesuthasan, Jesu perhaps, J-E-S-U-T-H-A-S-A-N. Um, and the... Uh, um, Headline, a word I forgot how to say, Singapore's free AI therapy bot is as problematic as you'd think. Um, I would kind of assume it wasn't great. Um, the app tried to relieve pandemic stress for teachers, a noble goal, right? I think that's a great thing to want. But instead, triggered, tries of, triggered cries of gaslighting and frustration. So we've talked on the channel um, about um, Basar died. Uh, no, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. Uh, Jesper. Oh, no, I'm late. Ah, well, we're glad you can make it when you did. Uh, yes. What was I talking about? Uh, da, 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 da. We talked on channel previously about how I don't recommend um, using automated systems to try and replace the, the patient there therapist, patient practitioner, to try and do therapy on people, right? Like, I think they can be helpful support tools, particularly for support with journaling, for example. Um, but for doing therapy, I probably wouldn't recommend them. I strongly have not recommended them in the past. Let me put it that way. Uh, oh, I didn't actually pass post the uh, model calibration thing to Twitch. Sorry. Uh... Yep. So anyway, it starts with a story about uh, Mindy, who f caught one of her students vaping, which is a crime in Singapore. Um, there's... Anyway, I, that's tangential and irrelevant, um, which is, you know, obviously very stressful. Uh, the police were involved. Her nurse were afraid. She dealt with the authorities, the students' angry family, and yet more administration. Uh, exhausted, she tried to try Mindline at work. The government supported online mental health portion with a portal with a section uh, catering to teachers. Um, so she talked about her her issues uh, and a little penguin that's the bot's avatar suggested a breathing app exercise. Uh, as the abstract animation pushed gently pulsed in and out, she laughed out loud. I was like, no, I just want someone to listen. I just want someone to be, I just want to be heard. Right. So uh, coming to the portal for help, anxious and burned out teachers were met with comments such as, remember, our thoughts are not always helpful. If a friend or family member was in your place, would they see it the same way? Scathing screenshots of the chatbot interactions went Reddit on viral, uh, went viral on Reddit, Twitter, and Instagram. I think I read that right. No. <laughs> Alexi says, no longer working on the therapy app, so I guess you won. I mean, I'm... We, we talked about this at length, so I, well, I'm not happy that 
you had to abandon a project that you felt passionately about, but I'm also not unhappy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, as part of the initiative, the Singapore government partnered with WISA, W-Y-S-A, one of the best known names in the AI therapy business. Uh, it's recognized as having one of the strongest evidence bases among similar groups and comes clinically recommended by organizational groups such as the Organization for the Review and Care of Health Apps, which, uh, no, we didn't talk about this on the channel. We talked about this on the, um, in my class that I just finished teaching, um, which, you know, I don't think, I think this organization in particular does not particularly recommend using apps over uh, talking to uh, professionals, but, uh, yep. Uh, in conversation with the rest of the world, users describe Mindline at Work as one side fits all program that struggled to meet teacher specific needs. More generally, psychology experts caution that partnering with digital wellness or therapy apps can backfire when the root causes of mental health problems in the workplace remain unaddressed. A growing critique of workplace wellness points out that through such partnerships, employers can outsource the responsibility to address mental health in the workplace, leaving other problems, work pressure, toxic environments, or unsafe conditions to fester. Um, I remember from a while back ago, there were images people were sharing of Amazon workhouse, work houses, workhouses, warehouses, well, little, little Freudian slip there, um, warehouses where uh, they had the little soundproof foods and they were like, take a moment of Zen and relax. And the Amazon workers were like, if I stop moving for less than 30 seconds, an alarm sounds, I can't use this. Um, and it does feel, you know, patronizing and uh, upsetting, right? So, yeah. Uh, Jeremy says, sorry on a personal level, happy on a systemic level, probably. Yeah, roughly that, yeah. Um, and, you know, there's something I talk about a lot is that general purpose things, I generally don't think tend to work as well as specialized things. I like specialized stuff, right? That's just a preference that I have as a person. Um, and part of that specialized stuff is that if you are building a technology project, it should solve a specific problem, right? And a teacher struggling at work is a specific problem, right? It's probably going to be related to teacher stuff. It's not the same as, say, you know, a truck driver feeling very lonely at work. That's going to be a different problem. There are different things that are going to be helpful for them. It's not going to be the same as, you know, a nurse struggling at work. It's, it's all going to be, be different. So. Um, basically, it didn't work very well and people didn't like it. Uh, and this is just an FYI. So this is uh, from datadetoxkit.org. Uh, and it is a little how-to app. <laughs> Docking says, workhouse might be a little bit, uh, might be more accurate from the worker's point of view. Yeah. Um, if you're... Uh, not super familiar with the history of workhouses. It's where um, it was part of the like carceral system in uh, England, like during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Jesper says, I once went to a university therapist. When I was done talking, he said, oh, that sounds stressful. And that was the end of the session. <laughs> Feel similar. Yeah. I mean, and maybe, maybe that is what some people need sometimes, but it's not necessarily going to address the specific problems that you had. Uh, anyway, so I'm just posting the, the link uh, in both the chats, uh, and it is basically a way for folks to uh, learn about what menstrual cycle apps are tracking and how to uh, decide whether or not you want your app there and then ways to get around it and do other things. Would you like to come onto my lap or are you just going to sit there and go wah, 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 wah? Can you hop up? Okay, he's just gonna sit there and whine. Apologies, you can hear him in the background. I can't pay you, I need my hand to mouse. Oh, a little stinker. Do you wanna hop up? You can do it. Oh, it's Ben Sam. Do you say hi to everybody? You don't know about cameras. Focus. It's Benson. Hi, Benson. You're very cute, everybody loves you. Uh, also, this is just an FYI. So this was on December 1st. This is from Ars Technica, uh, article by Dan Gooden. Hive Social turns off servers after researchers warn hackers can access all data. Um, yikes. 
Uh, so Hive Social was something that people were talking about as a uh, alternative to Twitter, um, not something that I'd ever considered using, but I do applaud them for making a very responsible decision. Um, you know, they were warned that uh, their user data was potentially impacted and just, you know, cutting off the servers and making sure that folks didn't have couldn't possibly have access to it, I think is a very um, user safety focused decision. So hello. Uh, so uh, I do I do applaud them for that. I'm sorry it happened. I'm sorry they built their way in an insecure way in the first place, but um, good job. <laughs> Alexi says laser, laser, laser. Yeah, he does sound like a, a little laser. Uh, Docking says, in the darkest hours of the cow clapless phase, the workers of the Amazon warehouses were not allowed to use the restrooms for vitally bodily, fun vital bodily functions. Yes, that is absolutely true. Um, also affects drivers. Um, I personally uh, don't use Amazon. Uh, Rachel, you're streaming on Twitch. I am streaming on Twitch. You also notice I have not monetized Twitch. Uh, this was intentional. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Jesper says, imagine doing worse than Twitter under Musk. What? I mean, one good thing about it is that, you know, they made the decision that hurt the company, but preserved their pri their users' privacy. And again, I applaud them for that. Uh, Alexi says, I like to chat with myself in Telegram, send messages to the future, and argue with the same message from my past. Very helpful to understand oneself. Yeah, yeah I would call that like a type of journaling. I am I'm an avid journaler. I also find it very helpful. So, like, I, I don't think that there's... Um, I don't think there's not a place for mental health support using automated things. I think that replacing the therapeutic relationship with it is the issue. Uh, uh, <laughs> Latour says, uh, Rachel ChatGPT, it's time to go become a psychologist and forget tech jobs if I want to make a living. Uh, yeah, I uh, don't know that I feel particularly called to psychology. So. Uh, all right, uh, this is uh, something that came up around the discussion of ChatGPT. Um, I don't think that it is currently gonna be accurate for stuff, but might be a good resource for folks. Uh, doop, 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 doop. So this is the Giant Language Model Test Room, or GLTR. .io is the, uh, the web address of this website on the internet. Um, and it is a forensic tool developed by MIT, IBM, Watson AI Lab, and Harvard NLP, uh, designed to uh, help um, identify uh, whether or not text was um, generated. Uh, specifically here by uh, GPT-2 small. So, uh, so here looking at uh, the output, this is going to be so hard to describe vocally for the people who are listening. Uh, it has some information about the top K uh, tokens in the text. Uh, the frac p, uh, the fraction of the probability for the actual word divided by the maximum probability for any word in the given position, and the top 10 entropy describes the entropy along the top 10 results for each word. Um, so you can see that the highest playing, the highest entry word is three for each word, right? There's, hmm? Top K, here's the entropy. Uh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so it's the distribution of the entropy across all the words. Um, so if uh, we look at the first word, we can see that the was very likely to be produced by this model. Um, cat was less likely to be produced. The most likely option would have been first. Was was the most likely next thing to be produced. Playing was not the most likely uh, thing to be produced. The top one was found, uh, and then A, broken, taken, and rescued. In uh, was very, very likely, the, very likely, uh, and garden, a pretty unlikely uh, yard, background, and backyard were the top three items. So just a way to look at the, uh, the sort of the entropy, and it's not quite perplexity, is it? Um, the f fraction of the probability for the actual word <laughs> uh, 
divided by the uh, maximum probability of any word in this position. Um, so it might be potentially a helpful tool. Uh, I don't necessarily know that it's going to be helpful with models after GPT. Do, do not lick. That's gross. No, thank you. Um, but potentially, and also possibly, possibly something that you could know. Thank you, sir. Um, expand for further models if you had access to them. So. Um, Cool tool, uh, great that it's still available, uh, potentially could be a way to um, start building something for, for text detection. So, so. all right, uh, Lovejoy says, uh, nice, yeah. All right, this, oh, such a good talk. So I'm gonna post the link to the top tweet and I'll, uh, I'll just sort of like go through and hit some of the high points. Uh, so this is from America's NLP. So this is the uh, second America's NLP. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's at NeurIPS and it's a, a workshop looking at the indigenous languages of the Americas. Uh, and they had a invited talk from uh, uh, Hilaria Cruz at C-H-A-Q-H-I-L-A-R-I-A -A -A on Twitter um, talking about the competition. This is the second one that they've done, uh, talking about the data infrastructure needed for created data sets and the relation with native speakers. Um, so I don't know, we've talked a lot today about sort of ways of putting together data sets that I'm not a big fan of. Uh, I think this is a good, very thoughtful discussion of how to put together a data set that's very challenging to put together. Yeah, got your hair in my mouth. Um, yeah, uh, so the problem is deeper than we think when we talk about language endangerment. Um, so we, I think we talked about language endangerment on uh, Tuesday as well. The massive decline of native languages in the Americas, reading here from her slides, is a direct result of the deliberative and programmatic exclusion of these languages by the settler colonial states, uh, as is the case for the entire American continent, Canada, the United States, Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina, um, which, yes, I, I am... Um, currently on what I believe would have been Monacan land, and I don't know that there are any living speakers of the Monacan language. Um, and that was due to very intentional choices um, by settler colonialists uh, and the violence done onto the Monacan people, among others, right? Uh, and there's been a lot of issues there, right? So uh, talking about, um, again, here reading, the indigenous peoples in the Americas have been forced to learn to speak, read, and write Spanish. Um, in the United States, that would be English. Um, in Canada, it would also include French. Um, it would also actually include German in the United States, a uh, fairly large German-speaking population here at one point. Oh. Uh, Speakers of the indigenous languages are deemed stupid. So obviously the language that you speak has no relationship to your intelligence and also attempting to, you know, define intelligence as a, a single value that is tied to someone's worth is in and of itself um, a questionable thing to do. <laughs> Why are you trying to do that? Um, but as a result, there is, you know, societal pressure against using their indigenous languages. Um, and the, the, the final point on this slide is the only knowledge that has value in currency are European knowledge, value, and philosophy. Um, right? So a problem uh, for, you know, the continued um, existence and use of uh, these languages in their in the indigenous communities who speak them. Um, and uh, one very common thing that people will do is that they will use the Bible as a source of indigenous language data. Um, so if you're familiar with, um, with language data, I guess, uh, worldwide language data, you're probably uh, familiar with the uh, SIL uh, SIL International, they, um, they compile ethnologue. So let me uh, pop it in here just so you can see what it is. Uh, they compile language uh, ethnologue, which is a, I would say an authoritative source about language communities and speakers. Um, and they are a Christian missionary organization, which is not always 
is uh, super uh, clear to people who are first coming into contact with their, you know, uh, content for the first time. A lot of linguists use them. Um, they've done a lot of very expensive things, um, which is nice to have access to those resources, but also they are very intentionally doing uh, their sort of language um, collecting and learning and recording work specifically to translate the Bible, right? Um, so with that context, uh, given the scarcity of corpora in minority languages, NLP researchers use translations of the Bible as text for their models, um, which lacks the reflection of the origin. So the origin here being like the origin of the, the data um, and what, yeah, to be perfectly frank, users of these indigenous languages are talking about in their day-to-day -day lives and actually care about, because that's perhaps there will be some relation to what text is included in a translation of the Bible, but it's probably not going to be the majority of the, the discussion. So, uh, yeah. James says, Scots is the largest language by native speakers unsupported by Google Translate, Meta, or Microsoft because of uh, one teenager in North Carolina who thought it was fun to load Scots Wikipedia. Oh yeah, the, the fake Scots stuff. Yeah. Uh, based on his emulation of groundskeeper Willie from The Simpsons, the Wikimedia Foundation refuses to step in and move all the scotched English to a separate namespace. Uh, yeah, that was a, a pretty big deal. And I mean, I would say, I mean, I am of Scottish uh, descent and uh, feel, you know, pretty strongly about the Scots language. I don't actually know that it is in fact the language with the most native speakers that is not supported by uh, Google Translate, Meta, or Microsoft. Uh, perhaps if you look at languages with dedicated Wikipedias, that is the case. Um, but yeah, I uh, I don't necessarily know that's the case because there's lots of minority languages with very large speaker populations that are very underserved by the NLP community. And I don't, I don't, I would be surprised if Scots was number one. So. Uh. Yeah, so if you are, you know, uh, interested in huge challenges in the field, um, working with minority languages is it, right? It is very challenging. There's not a lot of data. Um, again, reading here from the slides, current state of speech technologies in the indigenous languages of the Americas, rickety, rickety lack of pr practical orthography. So some of these languages will lack writing systems that are uh, computationally friendly. Uh, annotated corpora, insufficient corpus to carry out research with current NLP models. And this is an issue, right? Current NLP models, especially transformer-based models, straight up do not work if there is data scarcity. And lots of people have data scarcity. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I'm just not interested in another bigger transformer language model. Like, fine, works for English. How are you doing with Quechua? <laughs> Probably not very good. Um, speaker voice recordings are very minimal, uh, insufficient to start current NLP models. Uh, James says it's got about 250,000 speakers around Glasgow and Northern Ireland. All right, so we talked yesterday about Aroma, which is a language of, uh, it's Horn of Africa, so it's on the East, Eastern Africa. Um, let's see if Google Translate does Aroma. Because I believe it had several million speakers. <laughs> do you do a Romo? Okay, they do do a Romo. Do they do Quechua? Okay, they do do Quechua. Uh, I'm just coming up with random languages. This is not a very systematic way to do this. Um, Quechua. Yeah, they do have Scots. Oh, it's either Gaelic or Gallic, and I know that one of them is very wrong, and I don't remember which one it is, but, uh, yeah. Uh, Alexi says, I read Shaka Wikipedia entries in my uh, ability time to time. Some of the articles look funny because of the lack of research on the subject and weird entities. Interesting. Not a language I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, do they have Navajo? Okay, they don't have Navajo. How many native Navajo speakers? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
question mark. That seems like it's not super, uh... Uh... I'm not finding a super uh, conclusive answer. Mm -hmm. Seems like about 170,000. Navajo is a fairly, uh, fairly well, widely spoken uh, first uh, indigenous American language here in the United States. Right. Perhaps you, perhaps you are right, but it does feel. Um, uh, I would be surprised. Uh, yes, anyway, huge issue. Um, Alexi says, also inputting random stuff in Somali to English, Google Translate produced very interesting and unexpected results. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that is the, the question about the, the quality of the systems as well, right? Which I can't evaluate. I don't know most of these languages. Uh, Wikipedia says 170,000 Navajo speakers uh, as of the 2015 census. Uh, James says Scott Scalic is very different. Yes, I'm aware. Um, I was merely pointing out that uh, uh, another minority language in the area was um, was covered. Uh, but I'm aware that they are different languages. Um, yeah, so the, the big issues are data curation and organization, storage, maintenance, processing, distribution, and care of the same, all of which costs money, uh, and it's hard to get money, right? So, um, yes, lots of different uh, challenges. Some of the data is in archives, but it's very difficult because it is leg legacy data. Um, there's different notations, there's different orthographies. Uh, many of them are not, um, you know, machine readable. Um, the researchers are going to do different stuff. So um, just talking about some of the really big challenges in language technology, in this case, specifically speech technology when working with minority languages, uh, or honest honestly, anything that's not English. Um, and I think it's really good to have that perspective as language practitioners, particularly if you mainly do work in English, because it is uh, not uh, way, the way that most people uh, experience the world, right? So. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Now this, this was interesting. Uh, so this is, I believe, a Google product. Let me double check. I don't want to say wrong things. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it is a Google product. Uh, and this is a plugin for Sheets uh, that does some simple ML tasks um, that I thought was really interesting. Uh, Advent of Code people regularly have a suggestion to translate their random input data from Welsh or Maltese to English when they're in Chrome uh, intelligent systems. Oh, are they misidentifying? Uh, uh, code as being Welsh or Maltese. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, language identification is very difficult uh, and very difficult to do automatedly. And even the best systems tend to not do well with languages that are, again, not English. And sometimes not great with not like English languages. And sometimes, sometimes not great with English language varieties that are not um, particularly prestigious. Uh, interesting. Oh, Alexi says, I mean, when you put random symbols and ask Google to translate it from Somali to English, it would output, output very cryptic English sentences. Interesting, because isn't Somali uh, written in the same script as Amharic? Hmm. Uh, Jesper says, misidentifying gibberish mostly. Yeah. Uh. No, they have a separate script. Uh, the Somali Latin alphabet is the most widely used. Prior to the 20th century, Arabic script was used for written Somali. Uh, it was the main script, yeah, lots of stuff in Somali. Writing systems developed locally in the 20th century include uh, three different scripts. Interesting. I don't know why I assumed uh, it shared an alphabet. Does it sort of look kind of similar? No, not at all. Well, today I learned. Uh, isn't it a gift that there is always more to learn about the world? Um, anyway, so some of the tasks that they will do are one, predicting missing values, um, which potentially dangerous, but also something that people need to do a lot. 
um, identifying abnormal values, which I think is a great use of machine learning in this context, uh, and training and evaluating and understanding a model manually. Uh, but particularly, I think this thing for uh, spotting abnormal values, um, a task that finds potentially abnormal values or values that look different from other values in the target column. See case number two of the tutorial for a complete example. And again, this all happens in Google Sheets, which I think is uh, pretty cool, right? I think this is pretty accessible. And I think, you know, I talked about labor saving versus cost of labor saving. This is labor saving, right? Because otherwise you got to look at it, right? Or you got to do a bunch of graphing. And here's a way to potentially automatically tag things to investigate further. Um, so yeah, I think it is cool. Uh, oh, interesting. So Lexi says you would input, you know, a random uh, string from uh, uh, of Latin characters and it would output, um, you know, English text like I can see you. Um, cool. I guess if you do need Somali text translated, you probably would be putting in valid Somali, but it is weird that it will give you an answer. Um, that is not correct even in the slightest. Do I smell Embert? Maybe. All right, next up. Um, so this is a piece from Motherboard uh, by Chloe Xiang. Huh? Oh, I don't know that. Mm, okay, it's fine, it's fine. Y'all know what I mean, X-I-A-N, G. Uh, December 6, 2022, um, something we talk about a lot is how uh, a lot of automated systems in fact rely on very poorly paid uh, laborers around the world, and this is yet another discussion of this, uh, particularly M Turkers and how they are, you know, poorly paid and that the, the value of their work is being um, used to prop up, you know, multi-billion dollar, multi-trillion dollar corporations, so, question. Um, and uh, a big point is that a lot of these systems that people talk about as being fully automated, in fact, have a huge requirement for labor that is not publicly uh, discussed or admitted by the companies. Um, and the laborers don't feel appreciated, which you know what? Reasonable. I don't know. There's a theme of people working in uh, machine learning as a field, just sort of not appreciating the laborers upon whom they absolutely re rely and could not uh, work without. So, Xi'an. Uh, thanks, James. You know polyglot YouTube? This is the opposite of that. <laughs> I'll tell you all about all them languages what I don't speak. Uh, I am bi-dialectal though, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, good news. Uh, you know I love uh, security and privacy. It makes me happy. Uh, I'm not an Apple user, but if you do use Apple and you use iCloud, you can encrypt your backups. Uh, Great, fantastic news. So this is from the Washington Post uh, by Joseph Men, M-E-N-N, -N, published December 7th. Um, and yeah, the FBI uh, is, quote, deeply concerned with the threat end-to-end -end and user-only access encryption pose, uh, to which I say, go pound sand. <laughs> um, yeah, so good job, Apple. I'm sure this was a huge engineering lift. If you do use iCloud, I'd recommend turning on the encryption. Um, we love to see it. All right, and this came out today, question mark? Yesterday. Uh, so this is a book, it's an anthology from Data and Society, which is an actual research organization. Unlike some other organizations that claim that they are research organizations and are in fact venture capital backed uh, for-profit companies. Um, some, some, some organizations that I could name that somehow still get talked about as if what they are doing is research and not product development in a very weird way. I'm talking about OpenAI, I'm just gonna, obviously. Um, but uh, it is a uh, anthology uh, that, quote, brings together original stories about the everyday experiences of living with AI-based systems from storytellers in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and South Asia who explore themes including post-colonial computing, explore themes including post-colonial computing, data extractivism, dignity, solidarity, and data justice, um, which 
uh, I don't know, if you've stuck around watching me this long, uh, hopefully you're also themes that you find appealing and want to learn more about. So um, it is free to download. Um, if you are interested, uh, maybe if you have some some time off over the holidays, if you have holidays coming up, uh, you might take some time to, to sit down and, and read some of these stories, right? So, uh, and like I said, they are stories, so I think that they may be fiction, but sort of based on real events kind of is my understanding of how this works. Um, so for example, this one, uh, the tool is under development by Chesta Aurora. A project team struggles to build a browser-based web plugin to moderate hate speech, violence, and harassment in India. In India. Uh, uh, from Kimberly Fernandez, the body spread out into a database. The challenges of securing a unique disability ID in India is seen from multiple perspectives. African Ancestral AI by uh, Aishatu Gwadebe, possibly? Uh, a speculative sh story exploring an Ubuntu framework for conversational AIs and what it would mean to engage an app that holds the wisdom of the elders. Um, so, very interesting work from data and society i uh i don't know i think we could all use a little bit of positive imaginings in our life right now so uh give it a shot uh big fan of folks with data and society more or less um but yeah uh, a great thing for them to have shared <laughs> jester says chat gpt isn't obscure at all what are you saying hmm. uh occluded would that perhaps be a better word all right Politics. We've only got four things. It's a short section. Um, and I believe they're mostly court cases. All right. So first up, we have um, a lawsuit. Uh, so this is from November 30th. Um, I don't always find out about things immediately. Um, so I didn't include this last time, but uh, it's from December 30th. It's from Detroit. They filed uh, a lawsuit against ShotSpotter and it continues. Um, so this is from the Detroit News uh, by Sarah Rahel, R-A-H-A-L, uh, published November 30th. Uh, the Detroit, Detroit City Council approved in a 5-4 vote the four-year contract in October after months of debate over the controversial system. ShotSpotter, an aerial gunfire detection system, uses sensors to pinpoint the location of gunshot activity and sends it directly to police. Uh, and by sensors here, they mean microphones. Uh, and by the location of gunshot activity, they mean automated uh, guess about what they think might be gunshot activity. Um, and the use of ShotSpotter has been... Um, identified as the factor in the death uh, of at least one African-American child, he was 13, who was killed by police in Chicago. And I'm gonna take a drink of water and be calm. Um, also, as we recently uh, talked about on the channel, uh, they maintain rights to store and sell your data. They say that they don't, but the, the, the terms are in the evil. Uh, or at least were when the ACLU did their investigation. So, um, but there is a um, ongoing lawsuit. Uh, leaders behind the complaint are Eric Williams and Nancy Parker of the Detroit Justice Center, Tanya Myers Phillip and John Philo, PHILO, of the Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice, and Jack Schultz of Schultz Law PLC, all based in Detroit. Um, and basically, they said that they, uh, the, the claim is that the Detroit City Council did not uh, review and examine the technology for disparate impacts at least 14 days prior to the discussion of the new technology. The ordinance is a direct response to Detroit Police Department's renewal of a 2017 contract with DataWorks for facial recognition surveillance technology. Um, um, so I'm, you know, we've talked uh, a lot on this channel about how this technology doesn't work. It directly endangers people. Um, if you are not familiar with Detroit, it is a predominantly African-American city in the north of the United States um, that has also uh, been very poor. Basically, when the jobs went away, all the white folks left. Um, and it has historically been a very highly policed community where folks suffer from a lot of police violence. Um, so best of luck to these uh, activists and community organizers. I, I hope they win. All right. 
Next up from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so we talked about uh, Meta's ads uh, and the uh, the very beginning of the stream. I think I forgot to label this one with the label. Uh, anyway, uh, so this was published uh, December 6th by Sham Sam. Schechner? Schechner. S-C-H-E-C-H-N-E-R. Uh, by the Wall Street Journal. I think I said that. Uh, Meta's targeted ad model faces restrictions in Europe. Uh, EU privacy regulators said Facebook and Instagram shouldn't use their terms of service to require users to accept ads based on their digital activity. So basically what, what Facebook was arguing was like, oh, hey, you know, users agreeing to get targeted ads is just the price they pay to use our platform. And the EU is like, you cannot do that. Uh, nice try, Buster. So uh, yes, they have you. you ERP, oh, EU privacy regulators have ruled that Meta Platforms Inc. shouldn't require users to agree to personalize ads based on their online activity, according to people familiar with decision. A ruling that could limit the data that Meta could limit the data that Meta can access to sell such ads. You'll love to hear it. Um, I mean, I love to hear it. Maybe you do or don't, but either way, it's probably good to know. Uh, we also have a new story from San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jester says, should hack a loogie, which is to, to cough up phlegm, uh, nur, if my German doesn't fail me. Um, the, the joke that English speakers will often make about German is that it has a lot of uh, sort of glottal uh, sounds in it. Uh, also the joke we tend to make about French, even though uh, the French R is uvular, not glottal. Phonetics. Um, so this came out December 6, 2022. There is no reporter's name on it, uh, but it was published by NPR. Uh, and the San Francisco supervisors bar police you robots from using deadly force for now. So if you've been following this, um, uh, I guess, news story, um, the San Francisco Police Department wanted to buy robots and then let them hurt people. Uh, and the uh, Board of Supervisors has said that they don't want that to happen, but the police still very much want it to happen. Um, if you are unfamiliar with uh, policing in the United States, uh, they kill a lot of citizens every year without due process. And um, yeah, there's been, there's long been a discussion of sort of, there's many issues with police in the US, but a big one is this idea of militarization. So many police departments in the United States have equipment that was designed for war, right? So basically they have leftover, you know, guns, tanks. There are US police department that have tanks, um, you know, types of equipment, which is uh, mainly used in the theater of war. Um, and their, their argument is always that they need more money and more people and more of this um, you know, war equipment for generally public safety. Um, a stance that I personally take umbrage with. No. Uh, Jesper says, I do not like that for now in that headline, yeah. Uh, Alexi says, uh, Michigan, uh, this is a quote, Michigan has a literal location named Tell and a literal hell named Detroit. I mean, I have many friends that live in Detroit. I don't think it is. Um, the people of Detroit, uh, particularly the African-American population, has really suffered and been abandoned uh, by, you know, uh, their local government. And um, yeah, I, I would say the issues because Detroit's in Michigan as is uh, Flint uh, which if you're unfamiliar is another city in uh, Michigan that has a predominantly um, you know African-American black population um, that did not have drinkable water I think it's still an issue actually one sec I'm just gonna look this up really quick uh, Da, da, da. It started in 2014. So basically the lead water in the lead levels in French drinking water was uh, unhealthy, um, right? It was hurting people. It was making kids sick. It was uh, hurting individuals. Okay, so this says that it ended in 2017, uh, but particularly access to basic utilities like water and electricity um, continues to be an issue for many, uh, many African-American communities. 
as well as basic uh, things like air that's not polluted and, um, you know, et cetera. Anyway, the U.S. has its problems, uh, and I hope they get better, and I'm, I'm doing my part as much as I can. Uh-uh. So this is, uh, I thought this was just particularly interesting. Uh, this is from the law offices of Kate Downing. It is a blog post uh, posted on November 10th, 2022. Uh, and Kate Downing is a lawyer who apparently specializes in open source law. Uh, not a person that I'm particularly familiar with. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, don't, don't, don't take my legal advice. <laughs> Um, or I guess maybe do, but also talk to a lawyer. I don't know. I try not to tell you things that I think are wrong, right? That's uh, always my, my intent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesper says, the fact that the Flint story also loops back to Battery Boy, I can't wait that to be over. It's almost as if there's society-wide harmful effects of allowing a certain degree of capital accumulation, but a certain level at which uh, everyone is hurt because of it. Uh, Alexi said, I watched RoboCop as a kid. Detroit didn't look like a nice place. Ah, yes. Noted documentary RoboCop. Um, yeah, I... I'm going to ha have a little aside here. So I'm from the South, right? Um, which is something that I think even those of you from outside of the United States probably have some sort of assumptions about. Um, some of which are probably true. Um all our food is very fattening. <laughs> What's well, like our celebration food, like our party food, right? Um, not necessarily day-to-day, day-to-day food that we eat, but um, there's something that can happen if you are not careful where a place where people live, where those people are oppressed and not given access to the same opportunities and uh, quality of care that folks in other places are given, uh, where there sort of becomes this negative feeling towards the place that is then transferred onto the people, right? Um, and I see this a lot uh, after there's, say, a natural disaster that predominantly affects, affects folks in the South, where people will be like, well, good riddance, that's where, you know, all those horrible people that I don't like are. Um, that doesn't take into account the material conditions of the people who live there. Um, and the challenges that they face as individuals, right? Um, and it is dehumanizing, right? And what I try to do is very much think about the people who live there and what access they have and how they can be given, um, well, not given, right? That, that, that sounds very like paternalistic, but how the, the systemic issues that are negatively affecting them can be addressed in a way that makes their lives materially better, right? Um, and I, the, the sort of attitude that I think is very common to be completely dismissive of specific places, particularly places where there's a lot of, of poverty and sort of the, the outputs of poverty, like criminalization, um, ends up hurting the people who live there in a very material way, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, that's what I have to say about that. Um, and I generally try not to be Right, like absolutely, I'll be like, "Hey, this thing this government did was bad." Um, I think that that is perfectly fine and reasonable. But I try not to be like, "Hey, the people from here are bad," or "This place is bad, therefore the people there are bad." Um, and it's such a common and easy trap to fall into, particularly if it's a place where it's very difficult to leave if you're from there, um, or even if people can leave. That's where that's where their family is. That's where their folks are. That's where their kin are. They they can't it would be an unreasonable thing to ask them to leave all of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. 
I see it a lot and it always makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And I know that y'all are coming from a good place and you know, you, you have fun here, we're sort of joking around, but uh, it's just something to keep in mind, right? Just something to keep in mind. Yep. Yeah, uh, James says uh, roughly 10,000 lead or steel water lines have been replaced in homes in Flint by last December. That's great, that's great. I mean, uh, unfortunately that does not mean that every black community has had uh, similar, <laughs> similar degrees of infrastructure um, remediation, right? So Jackson, Mississippi's issue uh, recently, if, if y'all were following that, but yep, uh, yeah. Uh, Jesper says, I've had people almost apologize to me after they told me where they're from. Uh, it's rough and often just an indicator of poverty rather than anything else. Yes, right. And the poverty is generally due. Oh, I don't, know, I don't, know. I don't want to go too deep into like sociology and history, <laughs> but yep. Yeah. Uh... Alexi says, my home region is one of the most depressing places in Russia. It will need a lot of restoration after Putin is gone. Uh, hopefully I'm going to be a part of it. I hope that for you too. I hope that for you too. I am. I know I get upset about things, <laughs> uh, but I get upset because I care, and I care because I know things that can be, I know things can be better, and I think uh, a lot of people also care a lot and are, are doing what they can, and that uh, is important to keep in mind. All right, fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alexi says, people are bad, but it's because the federal and local government make them bad. I want to make them better. They're capable of being better, provided at least a single opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I have a social science background, right? Like, I tend to think about things with that perspective and, you know, things like even health, right? The social determinants of health. If there is no place you can buy fruit within a 30-minute walk of you and you don't have a car, you're probably not going to eat a lot of fruit, right? And that's going to have effects on your health. Or, um, you know, if you are in a, a situation where you are constantly having choices made for you that make you stressed and anxious, then you're probably going to be pretty stressed and anxious, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I am at heart an optimist, um, and I, I tend to trust people as a whole, um, not necessarily always in the specific, particularly if I've seen, uh, a behavior of, uh, untrustworthy behavior, a history of untrustworthy behavior from a specific individual. All right. First off. Um, so this was just a really cool story from Vice. I don't want to necessarily read the whole thing, but uh, about deaf streamers. Uh, so I'll just pop the link here in the chat. It's by uh, Amanda Florian. It was published November 21st, 2022. Um, talking about, um, you know, deaf streamers. Um, so the, the streams are obviously completely silent. Why wouldn't they be, um, you know, uh, the first uh, deaf streamer in China to their knowledge uh, is Roland Zhang, who began streaming on the Chinese platform Yinki, Yinka, uh, in 2005. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of discussion with different deaf streamers who are streaming in sign, and obviously there's a text component as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just a really interesting, uh, interesting discussion and particularly uh, since I know y'all watch streams, you might be interested in it. I missed one. God darn it. I was so close. <laughs> uh, Twitter has started doing something where you're logged, if you're logged out, where they watch to turn on notifications, a product change that I hate so much. We talked about it last week, but I thought I'd removed all of them and I missed one. Uh, so some good news from the National Museums of Scotland. Uh, they are returning stolen artifacts, which is great. Um, there's actually a, a museum near me uh, that I mentioned here in, in Richmond, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, that's what the FA stands for, um, that recently got a curator who's, who's also working to, to repatriate stolen objects. But uh, the National Museums of Scotland, uh, we are pleased to announce the National Museums of Scotland will be transferring the house of the <sighs> Jewel Memorial Pool to Pole, Pole, P O L E, to the Niska'a Nation. Again, apologies if I'm saying that incorrectly. I almost certainly am. 
Uh, this uh, delegation visited us in August to see the poll and make a formal request for its return. Uh, and I'm not super familiar with this nation, but based on the, the button blankets and uh, sort of hat patterns um, and various, you know, uh, visual things that I can see. I would guess that these are a people of the Salish Sea, um, so sort of north uh, northwest of the United States near Seattle. Um, and they're getting their stuff back. That's great. Um, we love to see culturally important artifacts being returned. There were a bunch also returned from the British Museum to Egypt, or like they're in the process at the moment as well, which is great. Um, yeah. Decolonizing. Uh... Another thing that I think might just be of interest to y'all, uh, so we talk about rest of the world fairly often, they're, uh, they're a, a news organization that burks. Uh, 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 Alexi says, there's one girl uh, with hearing problems who just flooded my YouTube recommendations. I've learned a lot from her. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I've, I've known a lot of folks in the in the deaf community from my, my work in signed languages and I'm in. It's a community of folks that tend to be great. Uh, James says, Refund, I'm really excited about Google's RAR, R -A -R -R, work on attribution and verification, which is super relevant to the chat GPT flaws in the limelight now. I love their emoji mascot, uh, tiger emoji. Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard about this. Hmm. Uh... Researching and revising what language models say using language models. Interesting. I might put this in our paper reading group because uh, I also would like to read this. Why do we have a paper reading group? Uh, because otherwise I don't read all the papers I want to read. <laughs> uh, to be blunt. Yeah. Add that to the, uh, the database. Yeah, thanks for that recommendation, James. I'll definitely check that out. Uh, Alexa says, not a lot of British things in British museums. But look, I think there are a fair number of British things, right? Like, uh, you know, the Sutton Hoo Hoard. Great artifact that you would want to see from Britain. Um, you know, various Celtic stuff, lots of Roman stuff, right? Like, it's not like Britain didn't have artifacts. They just went in to steal other people's stuff. <laughs> Jesper says, uh, you dog, we heard you like language models, indeed. Uh, but anyway, if you are, are interested in, you know, uh, global music, music from different folks, different places, uh, this may be uh, a cool place. I thoroughly intend to listen to this later. Um, it looks like they got links to both uh, YouTube and Spotify, if those are places where you listen to music. So, uh, Hong Kong, India, Mongolia, Ukraine, Indonesia, Nigeria, Japan, Mexico, Cyprus, um, uh, Argentina, so uh, lots of music from around the world, and I don't know about y'all, but I'm always looking for new music because I'm I'm a curious person. I want to know what's out there. So I thought y'all some of my like a little, little gift of, of music from around the world. Uh, some of you are actually probably already familiar with a lot of these songs. You're like, ah, you haven't heard of popular song in my country. So, uh, James says, "Yo, cat." Oh, <laughs> instead of "Yo, dog," because it's a tiger. <laughs> uh, Speaking of languages of the British Isles, uh, uh, James, you're gonna like this one. Uh, so this is from the Irish Times, which is why they call uh, the Isle of Man a nearby island. So I'll pop the link to this in the well. Uh, Docking says the Niska from Briti BC in Canada, so British Columbia, the province that is on the west coast, sort of on the bottom, because if you go too far up, it's a different one that I don't remember, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Alexi says, uh, check out some, uh, Yakushin music. Yeah. Oh, I don't think you can share la uh, share links, but if you want to share like a, any particular band names or songs you like, that would be cool. Um, Docking says, uh, they're from British Columbia, uh, Canada, which gives the plundering of their artifacts in their colonizing country, uh, even more suspect. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Um, would be good uh, for all plundered artifacts to be returned to the, you know, peoples to whom they belong. But uh, this is exciting. Uh, so the Island of Man, which is Isle of Man, there's no D, uh, which is sort of between Ireland and um, the big one, Britain. Britain's the big one, right? Oh, I think so. I think Britain's the big one because Britain includes Scotland. Yes. 
yes, England doesn't include Scotland, uh, is having a, a, a language revitalization success story, which is quite nice. Uh, so Minx, which is deeply entwined in hundreds of years in the life of the hundreds of years of the Isle of Man's history is now becoming part of the island's future. Uh, so they've got like a cute picture of some kids playing, um, speaking the Manx language as children play with chalk or learn geography at, oh, it's a, <laughs> so I'm looking at, at a two word phrase. It's probably in Manx. How is it said? Bunskul? Gala? I'm guessing. It's spelled B-U-N-S-C-O-I-L-L. -L. I'm guessing that this is school through borrowing. I could be wrong. G-H-A-E-L-G-A-H, uh, -E which I'm guessing is the name for the Manx language in the Manx language, because it kind of looks like Gaelic, Gaelic, etc. And that's all the guessing I'm going to do. Uh, Jesper says, Isle of Wight, Jersey, and Guernsey are the ones people usually know. Ah, huh, good to know. Uh, I also know about the Shetland Isles, but that's only because I'm a knitter. Uh, yeah. Uh, school on the Isle of Man, the language is now deeply entwined in hundreds of years of local history, blah, 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 blah. Uh, a decade ago, uh, UNESCO declared the language extinct, uh, and students stu then studying at the school took strong exception. To make their case that the language was anything but dead, they wrote a letter to the UN in Manx. Uh, it was sort of on the brink and we've brought it back to life, says Julie Matthews, the head teacher of the school, who notes that her students' determined efforts uh, pr prompted a new UNESCO core categorization of Manx as a revitalized language. So, lovely success story. Uh, congrats to the Manx speakers. I'd, I, I wish the language a long and happy future. <laughs> Alexi says, there's a lot of bad uh, Yukushi music. I'll try to make a list of the good ones. Yeah, that'd be fun. All right. Uh, and then my final one, uh, this is just a study I read about that seemed cool. Oh, I talked about the source for this last one. I did, yes. Um, so this is from CNN. It is by uh, Sandy, S-A-N-D-E-E, -E, Lamotte. Lamotte? Lamotte? L-A-M-O-T-T-E, uh, published Wednesday, December 7th, uh, and it's a news article discussing a scientific study. Uh, the headline is, Scientists Finally Know Why People Get More Colds and Flu in Winter, uh, and basically the, the outcome of the study was that um, physically being cold reduces the immune response, particularly of the sort of the nasal air passages, uh, and as a result it makes you more susceptible to infection in, in there through the, the breather bits. So, um, yeah, I just thought it was cool. A cool study. Uh, and I can put, they had a link to the study in here somewhere, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that it's open access though. <laughs> yeah, it's not open access. Uh, but they did, uh, you know, talk about the main results in the, the news story and they talked about the science, talk to the scientists that did it as well. So if you're interested, I'll post the link to the, the study. You can check it out if you like, um, but just kind of cool. So I guess the, the takeaway there is, you know, in the winter, you know, wear your masks, not that you, I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm wearing masks most of the time when I'm with other people, which is kind of rarely now. Uh, and maybe wrap a scarf around your face. <laughs> Jasper says, it's comforting that even linguists butcher names. Yeah, but it's more embarrassing when I do it. Um, and it's also one of those things that's a little bit of a curse because, like, I know how many language sounds there are. There's so many, and I know that I can't say most of them, so... Ugh. Anyway. Uh, so, that's all I had for today. Uh, it's been a couple hours. <laughs> uh, but I do, before we head out, I want to make sure that I... Where'd my thank yous go? My thank yous? Uh, hold please? My thank yous are gone. Oh, you know what it is. I 
know what it is. Hold, please. I'm going to put up my thank yous really quickly. Um, while I'm doing that, I do want to say a big thank you to all my monthly coffee supporters whose names are not on the screen, but are coming soon. Uh, let me get that. To download the most recent version. Um, I was uh, cleaning up my, uh, you know, various and sundry files uh, recently, and uh, I believe that in doing that, I accidentally deleted the file that I have linked here. So let me see if I can find it. Doop, doop. My patrons, um, they're not on Patreon, my coffee supporters. Um, so thank you, all of you. I really appreciate you. Um, the links for everything that we talked about today will go up at some point later today, I'm gonna have to feed someone who is yelling. It's the dog, you gotta feed the dog. Uh, and also have lunch, but it'll it'll be by end of day, um, uh, Eastern time for the US. Uh, and if you only want the annotated big biography for the papers that we read on Tuesday, there's a new tier for that. Uh, and there is also a new tier uh, that is a little bit of a joke tier if you want your name here, but fancy. So um, yeah. Thank you very much to everyone who supports the channel. I really appreciate it. Uh, you you pay for the bills, mostly. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you, James. Uh, interesting. Oh, Alexi says, I read an interesting paper on how your astrological sign affects your health. I think the reason was being born at different seasons affected the probability of getting seasonal-related diseases. Interesting. Uh, I would imagine that there would be a larger effect in a primarily agrarian uh, society than there is in a sort of modern urban society, but interesting. <laughs> like he says, laser, laser, laser. Yeah, sounds that uh, Benson, Benson is the dog. So, uh, thank you very much for joining me today, everyone. I hope you learned a lot. I'm sorry I swore. I'm not sorry I swore. It was worth swearing about. Um, and I, I don't know, I trust you all to do your best and that's all anybody can do. So stay safe, stay healthy, and I will talk to you very, very soon. Thank you for joining. Bye.